Okay, welcome to another episode of the Regenerative Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Max Gulhain, and as many of you would know, this podcast is all about understanding uh, chronic diseases and how to help people optimize their health. And for for a long time, I've been thinking about circadian health, and I've been following a range of people online on Twitter and uh, on YouTube who are talking about circadian health, light, mitochondrial um, medicine, and uh, similar topics uh, who are using these in, to, in, in order to optimize health and basically get to a level, another level of human performance uh, above which diet um, is unable to to get to. So it's been on my mind for a while. And for this episode, I've got on possibly the godfather of the entire movement. And that is Dr. Jack Cruz. And now Dr. Cruz is a neurosurgeon from the United States, uh, who, like a lot of the doctors I've interviewed on this podcast, had his own health journey, um, which prompted a very, very, very deep look into the fundamental drivers of disease and what he's learned and what he's been teaching for the past um, well over a decade has been that light and the light environment that we're exposed to is critical to health and to achieving optimal health. So in this this first podcast that I'm, I'm doing with Dr. Cruz, we talk about all things light and it is a very, very in-depth podcast. It's it's not a uh, necessarily a, a simple one to to understand. It, we go very uh, in depth into the history of mammalian evolution, um, a very important gene called POM C, um, the role of melanin, um, uh, the human cells and the mitochondria is generating their own sources of light, uh, and why mainstream wisdom or mainstream perhaps dogma about the role of sun in health is is wrong and, and many, many, many other topics. So this was an absolutely fascinating interview and I encourage everyone to bring an open mind into uh, what, what D- D- Dr. Cruz is saying because it is, it is frankly paradigm shattering um, for a lot of people who've, um, when we, we've traditionally placed diet, an optimal diet at the center of, of health. So what, what Dr. Cruz has to say is, is very much um, uh, putting light instead at the, at the center of that paradigm. So that's uh, I got a little bit of a preview about um, this next uh, three hours. And if you can't listen to all of it once, that's fine. Um, pause it, replay it, um, re-listen to it, understand it. And that's, that's definitely what I had to do to really uh, – understand and really draw out um, the essence of, of what he was saying. But it is absolutely fascinating, and I thoroughly enjoyed recording this podcast. So uh, enjoy, enjoy this upcoming recording, and stay tuned for another couple of episodes uh, of similar depth um, with Dr. Cruz. So thanks for your support, and uh, thanks for listening. I am extremely excited to be sitting down tonight with Dr. Jack Cruz. Now, he is a neurosurgeon, a biophysicist, a health optimization researcher, and effectively one of the godfathers of uh, an entire new area of, of health and medicine, which centers around the circadian rhythm and mitochondrial optimization. So, um, Dr. Cruz, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, no problem. Um, I like you, the way you said, told everybody, it's night time for you and it's not even daytime for me yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we've both got our circadian. So we're, breaking all, we're breaking all of our rules. Yeah. Well, I've got my blue blockers on. I've got a red light. You've got your uh, your whole place lit up red. So we're uh, practicing what we preach, that's for sure. Yeah, you, I, got you, I got UV in here too, just so you know that. Oh, uh, full spectrum. <laughs> Partial spectrum. Oh, yeah. Well, um. Well, why don't we start by maybe just giving us an idea about how you went from a centralized uh, mainstream neurosurgeon to what 
is basically um, uh, my black swan, what you call a black swan mitochondriac. So give us an idea of that that transition for the listener. Yeah, it happened uh, almost 20 years ago now. It's like 18 and a half, 19 years ago. And uh, I was given a talk about minimally invasive spine surgery to a group of neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons in Alabama. And I stood up to give my talk and had a horrible pain in my right knee. Long story short, tore my knee meniscus, had to have help to get to the podium, didn't understand how it happened. And um, one of the ortho guys um, actually examined me, he says, look, I think you've got a a meniscus tear. That's what's going on here. Uh, he asked me if I ever had any knee problems. The answer was no. Well, long story short, this guy happened to be married uh, to somebody who was involved, how shall we say, in centralized uh, p- paradigm of medicine. And she uh, told me, she goes, look, she goes, I think I know why this happened to you. Um, she goes, I'd like to share with you a book and a couple of papers. And my husband says, you're a pretty smart guy. She goes, I think you can figure this out. So she sends me a book written by Robin Sharma. Remember, this is a fable. It's not like actually a real science book. And uh, it's called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Then she sends me six papers, all different topics. But one of the things that they, um, they linked, I think it was one of the first papers, was about leptin. And she gave me pretty specific directions, you know, read the book first, then read the papers and then go through there. So I read the book and I thought the book was very interesting. Then I read the papers and then I thought to myself, what is she trying to tell me? And what she tried to tell me was that the paradigm was screwing, um, you know, people. It was big pharma going after us. That's what her goal was. Uh, but I took it a little differently. What I saw was she trying to tell me what was in the book possible. So what I did at that time, I jumped down the rabbit hole and went to the medical school library in the town that I was practicing in. And for about 18 months, um, I started studying all these links because when I went to medical school, I'm a lot older than you. Uh, Leptin wasn't even discovered when I finished medical school. Uh, So there was no way that I was going to learn about it, you know, in my training. This was something that, you know, happened afterwards. Yeah. And um, I was in uh, uh, probably 18, well, I wouldn't say 18. It was probably somewhere in the middle of this rabbit hole jump that, I went to Europe with my family and it was at the foot of Michelangelo's David where I kind of looked up at perfection and then looked at myself and I said, what's the, what's the main difference between perfection and him 500 years apart. And as I looked up, um, if you've ever been to Florence, you'll know that his statue is in a, a domed area that has windows And there's a big cornice that goes all the way around. And on the cornice, there was a a bird and there was light coming through the window that was hitting David. As soon as I looked up, that was it. Everything clicked. All the things that I had been reading about, uh, I was like, holy shit, I think I got the answer. And when I, I was flying home the next day on Delta and I basically wrote the entire quilt document um, that's on my website. Um, on these napkins, and I realized immediately uh, what the key was. The difference between David and myself was that he minded his circadian biology and I didn't, and that the light environment had changed. And from that eureka moment came the leptin prescription, the cold thermogenesis protocol. That was the basis of the... uh, of the 30 different levees. And I call them levees because I did my training in New Orleans and levees protect this city from floods. Um, but the, the real basis, like you go back and read the original leptin prescription as it's released on my, my website, you'll not notice uh, that everything about the leptin prescription is about light. 
And I realized when I figured out how this works, because I, I understood immediately that it was all biophysics. I'm like, how are people going to understand this when they have a biologic perspective? And I'm going to have to slowly release parts of the story. Well, it turns out, um, I guess this is where we'll, that, that's where, where I really got transitioned between centralized to decentralized. And I say decentralized for the listeners in the audience who don't know what the difference is. Centralized means there's a single controller, being big pharma, you know, the medicine boards, things like that. Decentralized means that there is no central controller. And it turns out in, in nature, there is none. And the, nature has the, the first ever decentralized network. It's controlled by light and dark. Two things. You have to have both for it to work. And then it works on coupled oscillations. But in the process, when I went back home uh, on the Delta flight, I went back to the medical school library to figure out some of the interesting uh, ideas that I came up with. Like, how does nature do this and do that? And one of the things that struck me about light, uh, when you read the book, um, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, it's about a, a lawyer from New York who basically was a total asshole, low dopamine guy who was really good at his job while he was fighting the judge and another lawyer in the courtroom. He has a heart attack and he changes his career. He was overweight. Um, he changes his career and he goes, sells his Ferrari and goes to the Himalaya mountains, comes back one year later, tan, svelte, strong, and his dopamine level magically went up. Uh, that's really the gist of the story. Um, so one of the things that happened at the foot of Michelangelo's David is I realized the story was really about light, water, magnetism. But the, the one that really struck me when the light came down uh, wasn't just the circadian biology link. The number one thing that always stuck out when I, when I was a centralized doctor was two things. Most of us in biology have learned about Darwin and his theory of evolution. And there's two things about Darwin's theories that makes no sense at all. If you believe in conditions of existence and random mutations, the two sore thumbs that stick out in this theory are the Cambrian explosion and also the age of mammals, when mammals came out of nowhere. And, and the real, I guess you would call it the pinky that sticks out, is the transition from chimp to human, how little data we have, and the fact that we have basically the same number of genes as our cousins. Th those things just don't jive with either the neo-Darwinists like Dawkins or, um, you know, what the dominant paradigm was. And I realized immediately um, when that light came out that the difference is when the age of mammals took over in 65 million years ago, mammals were already on the planet. They, they came around 210 million years ago, 220, you know, depending on the book you read. So for about 140 million years, they were small little furry creatures that lived under the ground outside of the sun. And one of the things that defines the, the family of mammals that everybody learns about, you know, in third grade, is they were little furry creatures that have hair all over their body. And they lived under the ground outside of the sun. And part of the reason they had to do that is the fur that they have or the hair they have is filled with melanin. And melanin happens to fluoresce. If you know anything about dinosaurs, because the other animals that made it through the last extinction event 65 million years ago were theropod dinosaurs. Those are dinosaurs that fly, that had feathers. What was the common tie between mammals and theropod dinosaurs? I immediately realized it was the melanin in their feathers. So I started to learn a little bit about melanin and found out that melanin fluoresces in sunlight. And we know that birds can see in the UV range through their retina. So that immediately told me that's the reason why mammals had to have an uh, underground existence, because it wouldn't be really good to put your melanin out with T-Rexes all around because they would, you know, come after you. And that's the reason why they stayed small, underdeveloped with not big central nervous systems. 
But what happened 65 million years ago was rather remarkable. The biggest, most feared carnivore on the planet that was built perfectly by evolution didn't get taken out because it wasn't well adapted to its environment. It was perfectly adapted to its environment. Something from outside came in and allowed these little mammals and flying dinosaurs to take over. And it turns out that was an asteroid event. And what, what's the genesis of this transition? Why was light so important to this story? Well, the key factor was when the asteroid hit the planet, a 50-mile cube of the crust of the Earth in Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico, went up in the air and blocked photosynthesis for a long period of time. The number one frequencies it would have blocked would have been the UV frequency. Um, so that would have left the dominant spectrum for a long period of time. Like this is still to this day a point of contention with evolutionary biologists. We don't know how long photosynthesis was interrupted, but the one thing that we do know for sure, it was interrupted enough that not one of those huge carnivore dinosaurs uh, ever lived past that event because we can't find any of their skeletons above a boundary everywhere on the Earth's crust called the KT boundary. And that KT boundary is everywhere. It's in Antarctica. It's in Australia. It's in the United States. It's everywhere. And there's never been one dinosaur fossil found above it. Um, so then in, in this journey in the medical school during this 18 months, I said, what was it that allowed these little mammals to basically live without any food chain. And it's just, when you actually think about it, you're like, these T-Rexes, these brontosauruses, they all got taken out because there's no food around. Well, they're massive creatures, so they need a lot of energy. And I thought to myself, if they got taken out, it, this event probably had to happen relatively quickly. Like, I didn't think it lasted a 100 or a 1,000 years. It, it was not plausible to me why birds and mammals would make it through if that was long. I said, I could probably buy a year, maybe two. But then I thought about the mammals. The birds were easy to explain because they could fly to where um, parts of the, the earth where there wasn't a lot of particulate matter in the air and, you know, it, photosynthesis would recover. But the mammals were a really different conundrum. And the more I thought about it, I said, there's got to be something linked to their physiology, tied to light that was important. And in the medical school library, um, I found it. And it's a gene. It's a gene that mammals have amplified through their whole existence. And in fact, they define this gene. And it's called the POMC gene. You probably learned about it in medical school, but don't know that much about it. And the people who in medical school learn a lot about it are neurosurgeons, uh, predominantly. Not even endocrinologists learn about it, but it's called pro-opio-melanocortin. And the reason why it's really important is because this gene product isn't active itself. It basically includes about seven peptides, and these seven peptides are cleaved. And if you remember the story that we're laying out here, how did mammals make food when photosynthesis was interrupted? For those of you listening to this that don't know, in the entire food web on planet Earth is linked back to the sun. It's linked back to photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, there is no food. And I knew, I asked the question to myself, does nature ever make any mistakes? And the answer I knew implicitly was no. And I said, how did these furry little bastards survive this event? And that's when I realized that mammals were one of the only animals on the planet that could make light, I should say, make food from light. And that's how they did it. And the reason I realized it is one of the key things that you also learn in third grade about mammals is that they stay underground for six, seven, eight months at a time and they hibernate through the winter. So they have to have a built-in program to do that. And it turns out this POMC gene creates 
some cleavage prodigals. And you know these things, Max. You've learned about them, but I don't think you've ever learned about them in the framework that I'm giving you now. So when I told people that in many podcasts that I've done before this, uh, probably the only one that I, I've actually told the whole truth is the one I just did with Rick Rubin. You're probably the second one now. Is that when I said that we can make food from light and that food fundamentally for the mammal family doesn't matter as much as everybody thinks, nobody ever questioned me about why I had that belief and why I'm axiomatically been proven true about it. Turns out POM sees the reason. So I'm going to take you back to medical school, Max, for you to think about this. Let's go. One of the cleavage products of, of POM C is ACTH. You've learned about ACTH, haven't you? Sure. Mm -hmm. ACTH is, makes cortisol, stimulates cortisol in the body. And cortisol is a glucocorticoid. It means it makes sugar. So that's A, how they got their food source, okay? So mammals figured out 210 million years ago how to basically recreate photosynthesis by utilizing this one gene product so they could stay underground. The second thing that's made in this cleavage um, that occurs with POMC is something called corticotropin-like intermediate peptide. We call it CLIP for short. Max, do you know what CLIP uh, functionally does in mammals? No, I don't. It's an insulin secretog in the pancreas. So you know what that means? That means in every mammal on this planet that when they're in blue light, this creates sugar and insulin. You don't have to eat any food at all. And it turns out this was how mammals made it through the last extinction event. And I realized immediately that this had huge implications. And I'll explain to you the reason why, because we are starting this podcast talking about light. These nuances are extremely important for you to understand mammals like us now, because we are now 65 million years later, we're the penultimate mammal. And one of the things that you need to understand that Darwin did have right when he talked about uh, his, in his book, conditions of existence or random um, or natural selection, he believed in his original work, the first edition, that conditions of existence were more important than natural selection. You know, as a young doctor, and I know that that's not what's sold in medical school. It's exactly the opposite. And it turns out this story that I'm unfolding, you know, for people over the last 20 years is that POM C is the key. And it turns out when the light environment changes, it has massive contextual implications for this gene. And it turns out 65 million years ago, the contextual change was these small brain, little furry mammals were able to create enough sugar after the dinosaurs were dead, they were able to come out of their holes. And when they came out of their holes, some magical things started to happen with their fur, their skin, and their brains. What effectively happened is they sucked in, um, they sucked in uh, the melanin inside their brains from the outside, and eventually that suck-in phase was critical in forming you know, humans, because now 65 million years later, humans are a mammal that don't live underground, that live on the surface and have an organ in their head that is a Ferrari engine. They're very different than the mammals that made it through 65 million years ago. But guess what the problem is? They still have Pomsi in their eye, their gut, their respiratory epithelium, on their skin, they have it just about in every single neuroectodermal uh, tissue back from the embryo. And this has really been lost about bi in biology. They don't understand fundamentally that you don't need to eat carbohydrates to get diabetes. That's what they believe. And the problem, the reason why they believe that is because they don't functionally understand how POMC works. So now let's talk about the penultimate uh, mammals, which is us. 125 years ago, 
Tesla electrified the surface of the planet at the World's Fair in Chicago. That was the day that humans effectively turned off the sunlight themselves. It was their asteroid event. For the last 125 years, we have lived with POMSI now doing exactly the opposite that it did to the early mammals. See, the early mammals took huge advantage of this. Why? Because when you secrete glucose and insulin, and you may not know this, Max, your listeners may not know it either. The other thing that it does, it speeds up epigenetics and fertility. Actually, you get precocious puberty. And can you see that even today in humans? Yeah. If you put a kid in front of a, a screen, uh, they'll start early sexual development because of these two factors. And it's so funny to read the pediatric literature where they scratch their head and they don't seem to understand it. And it's always made me chuckle for the last 20 years that I've been sitting here teaching people about this over and over and over again. And instead what they want to do is argue with me that I'm wrong. Instead of actually looking at the data in my argument mm. and this gene has been sitting there forever. But see, the problem is the gene only explains part of the problem. Because when you understand what I'm saying, that mammals actually recreated photosynthesis and they have gluconeogenic properties built not only to their brain and their liver, they also have other Ferrari engine opportunities available to them. The key is understanding that we are not little furry creatures that live under the ground. We are now mammals with Ferrari engines in our head that absolutely are creatures of light. And it turns out the light that we're not adapted to is blue light. We're, we're exactly the opposite of the little furry creatures that lived under the ground. Why? Because it turns out blue light turns off POMSI uh, expression. Guess, guess what is the part of the sun that actually increases pro opio melanocortin? UV light. Now, you happen to live in a desert who believes functionally that the sun is toxic. When you understand how ironic the biology of POMSI is, and you think about the centralized paradigm that's out there, you're like, wait a minute. We need UV light to penetrate into the places where POMSI is to create these cleavage products. Um, and it turns out the proof is everywhere you look. In fact, the number one opsin in the human brain is melanopsin. And melanopsin is critical in terms of doing signaling in the brain. But where it begins, the, the, this key story is with POMSI. And what I found when I went to the medical school library is there is a very key track. Because remember, at the time, I was six foot two, 365 pounds. The key track was called the leptin melanocortin pathway. And I realized right away this was a POMC story. And then I looked deep into POMC, very deep, deeper than you can imagine. It's been my absolute passion as a decentralized physician, it, it drives me every day to teach people about light, water, and magnetism, because this wasn't the only conundrum that I had to solve. There was a lot of other conundrums that biochemistry couldn't solve because POMC fundamentally is a biophysical gene. This is the main reason, Max, that you have learned it in medical school, but you didn't learn it the way I'm talking about it now. Not at all. Most people in the centralized paradigm believe you have to eat food to raise your blood sugar. Most people believe you have to eat food to raise your insulin. None of them realize that blue light by itself raises CLIP and ACTH by itself. Through and the POMC mechanism. The, you got it. We're the yeah. only animal on the planet. And remember, we now dominate the planet. And you look left, you look right. There's not a lot of amphibians and, and reptiles still left. There's some, but not a lot. We're it. 
And every single mammal has this program built into them. This is not like uh, Jack Cruz's opinion. It's a fact. And it works. There's only one part of the spectrum of light that stimulates POMSI. And most people are stunned to find out it's UV light. And the reason why it should make sense goes back to the story, Max, 65 million years ago. When the dinosaurs were dead and it was safe for the mammals to come out from underneath the ground, what returned? The sun and photosynthesis. And it turned out that mammals, for the first time in evolutionary history, were able to live in UV light for a long period of time. And this light sculpted the palm sea gene. So what else got sculpted? What else is in palm sea, Max, that you learned in medical school? Alpha MSH, beta MSH, gamma MSH, beta and endorphin, and actually met enkephalin. So the question became for me in those 18 months after reading The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, how much do I know about each one of those things? And you could probably imagine, not as much as I needed to know, mm -hmm. but I changed that very, very quickly in the 18 months. And I became an expert in the Palm C system. So not that I'm going to dive down through all of this, but I distilled it all down to key information that a guy like Max, who comes 20 years later, who's got a medical degree just like I do, where I could explain to you some of the most counterintuitive things to you that you've heard in medical school that I'm going to say. For example, you don't need, food is not the most important part of optimal wellness. That, it was like, when I said that 10 years ago, the functional medicine guys the alternative guys, even allopathic medicine just went. But you know, the funny thing is, Max, they argued with me because obviously they believe their experience was accurate. None of them asked me the key question. Why? And I kept talking about leptin and I came up with the leptin prescription. I came up with the cold thermogenesis protocol. Nobody in the last 20 years really fundamentally ask me the right questions. So like today or yesterday on Instagram, I posted a, a picture, two pictures. I said, the single most important thing with optimal health is asking open-ended questions. The second picture, same thing on Instagram says, the questions that are open-ended need to be specific. So Max, as I talk to you laying this story out, do you understand why? Those two Instagram pictures are there because the question that you need to ask yourself as a patient or a physician, how much do I really know about POMSI? I know, I know what I've read about Jack's work about the leptin prescription. Uh, I've heard about the cold thermogenics of protocol, but I'm not really sure how this links back to this POMSI story. Well, Greg, guess what? Now you're in my classroom. Now I'm going to teach you what I learned in that 18 months. And when I stood at the foot of Michelangelo's statue, I realized as soon as that light hit my eye, that everything that I was taught in medical school and residency had to be seriously questioned. It meant that we truly are creatures of light and the creatures of light we are hamstrung by our mammalian biology today. Um, the dominant paradigm in centralized medicine is that the sun is toxic. You live in a country where this mistake is way worse than it is in my country. But that's also the reason why you guys have more autoimmunity and obesity than we have. And here's where the funny part of the story is for you, where, where you need to pick up the baton where you are. Realize that the leptin melanocortin pathway is the obesity part of the story. Um, now, the autoimmunity part, that's not well known even today. I haven't talked about it too much. I've talked about it enough over the last five years, but that's related to decreased functioning between CLIP, ACTH, and predominantly beta and gamma MSH. 
Why? Because that controls both arms of the immune system in mammals. And this pathway goes back in evolutionary history to something you also learn in medical school, which is called the major histocompatibility uh, gene. That's actually, with POMC, what formed the transition between chimp and human. Why? Because if you look at our nearest cousins, uh, they have basically the same number of genes that we do. But yet, you look at us, we have two extra lobes in our head. That's the reason why it's grown out. Compared to chimps, the way in which we birth our babies is different. Our skin basically has hardly any hair on it, very little. And the amount of melanin in our skin is radically different than they are. Yet, we have the same number of genes. So this told me right away that the other part of POMC, alpha, beta, and gamma, MSH, are the key to the human story. They are the key to what is written in all the religious textbooks that are out there. You know, what's written in Genesis 1-1 1, 1 to one twelve. What was it? And I always tell my own members this, that God and evolution, I think, have the same problem. They're hamstrung by the same issue, that they tell you that light's a big part of the story, but they don't tell you the recipe. And I guess what I'm laying out to you here, Max, I think I got the recipe. And I've been teaching people the recipe for a really, really long time. The problem is they have not functionally understood what makes our family, the family of mammals, stick out. Why is light so important to us? So getting back to Tesla, realize that we changed the game again. In other words, when the environmental context changed, uh, so did the gene product. We were highly dependent on POMC through UV light creation for most of our transition all the way up to 125 years ago. And then we recreated the conditions of existence that were at our genesis, at the KT event. We went back to a blue light society with no UV and we subtracted out all the red. Here's the problem. Were we furry little creatures that lived under the ground? The answer is no. We were... We were diurnal creatures that lived above the ground that have Ferraris in our head. I was like, wait a minute, this is absolutely a thermodynamic mismatch. This is, this is highly destructive. And when you understand the machinations that occur in POMSI, high blood sugar, high insulin actually turn off the other part of POMSI. Turns off alpha, beta, and, and gamma, MCH. Oh, I should say MSH. And then I realized immediately, holy shit. We're, we are creating our own problem. Like everything about neurodegeneration, everything about diabetes can be understood functionally when you understand truly what POMC is doing. You have, you have multiple sclerosis. It's no longer uh, a shocker. So I have been slowly teaching all the little pieces how to get you there. Remember, if you look on my, my old website, jackcruise.com, there's a quilt document there. The quilt is made out of 30 different pieces. To understand Palm C fully, you need to understand each one of those pieces. So, Max, when I became decentralized 18 and a half years ago under the foot of, of David, I had to come up with a plan. Because if I would have told you as a young medical student, say back then, if just assuming you were, that this story is about light and the light that I needed to understand about is photons, electrons, and protons. And then I saw the link in biochemistry right away that, oh shit, this is tied to mitochondrial function because that's actually the input and output of mitochondria. I was like, I need, I need to seriously educate myself. And I realized the science that defines this wasn't the science that I learned in biology. It's not the biologic science that are foundational here, it's physics. And it turns out the type of physics that it is, it's not just one branch of physics. It's condensed matter physics. It's atomic, um, what we call AMO physics, which is uh, atomic molecular orbital physics or organization. And then uh, the third thing it is, it's quantum mechanics. Then it's also solid state physics. That's the physics that defines how semiconductors work in your cell phone. And when I realized all this going through 
this 18 months doing my homework. I was like, how am I going to give this story to a guy, a young Max? How am I going to say everything that's going on in your tech devices is going on in you without you thinking I'm absolutely batshit crazy. And that's when I came up with the idea about the quilt document. That's when I came up with the idea. Well, I can distill this down into two protocols, the leptin prescription and cold thermogenesis. So since we're talking about light, let me explain to you the distillation of those two things, which I'm sure people will look at. I hope people go back to my Jack Cruz website and look up both of these protocols. You will notice that everything that I've told you right now is not in those protocols. I don't want you to know how much you don't know. I just want you to do what you need to do, which is get in the sun and use cold while you're in the sun. And I'll explain to you how it works. Um, the details are being filled in right now, you know, on my blog for the last 10, 15 years. I've been writing pieces of this out to explain it to you. So the leptin prescription basically is you must stimulate um, POM C everywhere in your body that it's located via UV light. So that means the sun is in, important. So to prove that to you, Max, definitively, that everybody in Australia that tells you the sun is bad, because this is specific for your audience, they need to understand that beta endorphin is also made in POM C. What is beta endorphin? It is an opioid chemical. Nature made us to be addicted to the sun. Hard stop. Everybody in Australia is going, you got to be shitting me. We're slipping, slathering, sunglassing, and all this stuff. You are doing everything possible to ruin POM C signaling in you by doing that. So once you understand how POM C is built, then you begin to realize, okay, I need to turn off the centralized experts that really haven't looked deeply into this biology. So that's one thing. Then you, you make another, you make another uh, opioid. It's called metencephalin, also from this. Metencephalin is also an opioid that works on the endocannabinoid system. Most of you probably know that that's related to THC and marijuana, but it, it's highly important in neuroimmune modulation and also immune modulation. Well, everybody knows, cor correct me if I'm wrong, 4% of the world now suffers from autoimmune conditions. And Max, I'm, I'm sure you can tell your own audience that when you're in medical school and they teach you about MS, they never have an answer for what causes it. The only thing they know is that when you get closer to the equator, it goes away, right? Yeah, correct. Right. So your job as a doctor is to treat all these people with this condition and try to figure out how in the hell it happens. And you come up with all these big pharma solutions that are worth nothing. It's garbage, hard garbage. What they need is the sun. Why? Because everybody that has MS has a defect in POMC. They don't have enough of it. And that's where you begin. So that's the functional idea behind the leptin prescription is get mammals who absolutely can't live without the sun back into the sun. That was goal number one of decentralized Jack. Goal number two was a little bit different. How was I going to explain to people that the magic that's in our family of mammals is something more shocking? The other part of the POM C gene, which makes melanin, and for those of you who don't know, melanin is in our hair, gives uh, our color to our iris, and also the colors of our skin. Uh, black people have more melanin than white people. Uh, but where the real issue for humans is, is inside the brain. That's where I live as a brain surgeon. That's where uh, we create massive amounts of melanin inside our brain. And the melanin in our brain is different than the melanin that's on our skin. It's called neuromelanin. And neuromelanin is very, very dark. Max learned about it uh, when he did neuroanatomy and anatomy in medical school. And he learned about something called the substantia nigra. Every single medical students, whether they like neurology or neurosurgery or not, 
they know about the substantia nigra because you cut that part of the brain open and all of a sudden you see like this black dirt in your head. And it turns out that this neuromelanin is in a lot of different places that people to this very day still can't understand. And what you need to understand about color and science is that color has a very peculiar link to sun the lighter something is. So let's let's talk about what we're made out of. The number one chemical in our body is collagen. So collagen is made out of carbon uh, and other amino acids, but basically carbon. It's a triple helix. And I was like, this story has to tie back to the way we're using uh, carbon. So I looked at something common a diamond and a diamond's made out of carbon too. It's a cubic arrangement. Um, and that's when I found out that a, a diamond actually can be a semiconductor. I didn't know that. And it turned out it's called something called a wide band semiconductor. It has a band gap of 5.4 electron volts. I found that topic kind of interesting. And then, um, as a, a medical student and, resident in neurosurgery, I was very interested in spine surgery. So the program mentor for me was Dr. David Klein, who's a world famous neurosurgeon, now retired. He was an expert in spine and peripheral neurosurgery. He said, Jack, if you want to be a spine surgeon, you need to understand how bone regenerates. He said, there's a very interesting guy from your home state that published papers in the 60s that he goes, most neurosurgeons and biologists danced over his name is Robert O. Becker. He goes, I want you to do uh, a presentation for all the residents on his work. And when I opened up the books, now we're going back in time now. This is 1991, 92, 93. This is before leptin was even found. I started to read the original papers of Robert O. Becker. And guess what I found in his work? That bone doesn't heal. Let me say that again, Max. Bone doesn't heal. Bone actually regenerates completely from de-differentiated cells. And I thought to myself, why have I never heard this before? And why, why isn't anybody talking about this? Then it got even more interesting. I found out through Becker's work, he went through the machinations of how this works. In order to get an adult cell to de-differentiate and then go to a stem cell, it turns out you have to have a very, very small current. The current is on the order of one milliamp to two milliamp. If, if it's not at that level, this process doesn't work. And what did Becker use to figure this stuff out? He actually used salamanders, frogs, uh, because most people know that they have an incredible ability to regenerate. And he was able to cut their hearts out, re do, rebuild their hearts from scratch. He was able to cut parts of their brain out, cut their limbs off. But the reason he did all this study, every, everything grew back in these animals. He knew that that ability, for some reason, had been lost uh, or appeared to be lost in really um, evolutionary evolved mammals, kind of like primates and us. But it turned out a lot of animals below us had this ability, and he wanted to know why. So he did papers, and he used bone. He used human and primate bone. And in there, he found out that human bone uses semiconduction to regenerate, to create this small current. He called it the DC electric current. But the, the thing that stunned me when I was reading these papers as a young doctor, uh, that collagen, he found, was an N-type semiconductor, meaning a negative semiconductor, created a hole that an electron moved out of. And the first time I ever understood what that meant was through Becker's work. It wasn't through physics. It was actually Becker who taught me this. And then I found out that hydroxyapatitan bone, which is the other side, is the P-type semiconductor that actually generates the electrons. And it turns out that light is needed to move the electrons within the system. And Becker even figured out that much like a modern uh, LED light in your house, that semiconductors will fluoresce light 
when they are hit by light. And I'm like, wait a minute. This was all in my head, early 90s, before all this stuff happens in the early 2000s that I laid out to you about POMSI. So you have to realize this was foundational work for me figuring out what POMSI was doing. I knew immediately that POMSI worked via semiconduction. Now, the cold story, to get back to that, because don't think I forgot it, because I haven't. <laughs> Turns out, when you realize that POMC is a wide band semiconductor that uses melanin, water, and specific atoms on the periodic table that Max can verify, seems like all of biology is really prejudiced or racial to sodium, potassium, magnesium, and then sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, uh, and carbon. But we, we don't use a lot of other things. Like I always tell people, you look at the periodic table, humans use elements from 1 to 53. In 1 to 53 on the periodic table, it's really bizarre. We don't use all of them. Some of them we actually reject. But the ones we use, boy, do we use them. We really use them. And they're in most of the key chemicals that are in our body. And I realized right away the issue with color came back. I thought about what POMC did. Melanin. Melanin is really, really dark. You know, you can look at a, a black person and know that, but that's not how I looked at it initially. I, I remember about the substantia nigra and the link to Parkinson's and the link to dopamine. I'm going, what is the link to semiconduction with color? And I put two and two together very quickly. Turns out that something that is translucent, like a diamond, even though it's got a high band gap, it reflects all frequencies of light. Something that's as black as the ace of spades in semiconduction <clears throat> actually absorbs all light frequencies. How did I learn that bit of information? When I was a young boy, I lived in New York City, and uh, I used to go to a lot of the museums. Um, and I didn't have any money at that time. I was a poor white kid growing up in the richest city in the world, but they used to have these groups of old ladies that would teach all these rich kids different things in the, in the museum. And I remember one day I was in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I was probably in, I, I think fifth or sixth grade at the time. And they were looking at pictures, um, of different artists. And I forget who it was, but I almost want to tell you. It was Monet, just thinking back about it. And the, the lady who was teaching the people mentioned one of da Vinci's pictures <clears throat> that he painted uh, called St. John's the Baptist. She goes, if you ever go to the Louvre and see it, she goes, you'll notice that this picture looks very, very unusual. And the reason it looks unusual is because 500 years ago, it didn't look the same as it looks today. And I was like, what? I, that kind of stunned me. And she went on to say, she goes, it has to do with back in the day, artists used to make their own paint. And the background of, of that picture, when Da Vinci painted, used to be red and orange. Today, if you go to see it in the Louvre, it's black. I mean, really, really black. And it turned out the reason for that, she went on to, to say, is that the atoms in the paint changed its oxidation state over the last 500 years. So now the picture looks dark and she goes, now it absorbs all types of light. And um, she had commented back then that, that uh, the art world believes this is a, a fact tied to semiconduction and, in the paint. And I looked into it in those 18 months. Turned out that's where I found out what selenium, what iron, what manganese and magnesium can do when their oxidation state changes. And then I remembered in medical school that I learned about iron and hemoglobin and that iron and hemoglobin comes in two states. One is ferric, the other one's ferrous. One is plus two, the other one's plus three. When hemoglobin's plus three, it releases oxygen and nitric oxide at terminal electron acceptors in mitochondria. And I'm going, Somehow I think this is going to be important. Turns out it's really important for POMC because you have to have massive amounts 
of oxygen around to renovate melanin to make alpha MSH, beta MSH, and gamma MSH. So, Max, the story that I'm weaving for you right now is how did I come to realize that light was really important? I knew that light was tied to POMC because only UV light stimulates it. I knew that it was a semiconductive protein, and it turned out it made semiconductive proteins that responded to different frequencies of color. For example, ACTH responds more to blue light, and it turns out the alpha MSH, all of them, beta and gamma, respond to really big time UV light. In fact, UV light that is stronger than the spectrum of the sun. Wow. So I went back to that Robin Sharma book and I thought about what she, what Robin said in that book about Julian Battle and how his life changed so rapidly and so fast. And I started to put two and two together. I said, is this because he was actually able to reestablish Pomsey in his body to sculpt himself? That's actually what I took out of the book, not what the lady wanted me to believe. She wanted me to go after Amgen and how they shelved the leptin trials. I took it a totally different way. And I kind of figured out pretty quickly that this story of Pomsey is the story of all of us. It's the story of what's going on on the surface of our planet in our clinics. It's the reason why everybody's getting sick. Your disease functionally is linked to if you can't make enough POMSI in that tissue, you're going to have a problem. And that problem is going to manifest in your mitochondria. Yeah. And I began to realize very, very quickly how it all worked. And I started working this out. I started, I first, the first person I ever did the leptin prescription in beside myself was my son. I fixed him. Then I did it, my nephew fixed him. Then I had one of my gastroenterologists who was amazed at how much weight I had lost so fast. And I told him, I said, Don, I think I found something. He says, well, look, I got this patient I can't do anything with. They've got esophageal, uh, I mean, um, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. And Max, you know that a neurosurgeon would never take care of that in conventional medicine. No, no, no. Um, so guess what? He sent me, he's a, he was a gastroenterologist. He sent me that patient and I fixed that patient in four to six weeks. And he didn't tell me this, but he actually had the same problem. And I think he was not being altruistic when he sent me that patient because he had been all over the world. He went to the Mayo Clinic everywhere else, and he was never able to knock this off. So when I fixed his patient, he called me up and said, what do I need to do? And I said, well, just follow this leptin prescription. I said, go see the sun every day, see the sunrise, get as much sun as you can, but you need to use cold. And I, you need to start taking cold baths. And he said, why? I said, look, it's not important why, but this is what I'm going to tell you. Mammals figured out after they came out under the ground that if they get in cold environments, they can make stronger UV light from their own tissues than even the sun provides. This is what fueled all their evolutionary growth. And he goes, what? I said, yeah, it, the process is called wideband semiconduction. Basically, you take visible light from 250 to 760, you use non-linear optics, the, and the things that you use are wide-band semiconductors. I said, the wide-band semiconductors that you know in biology are called hemoglobin, chlorophyll, and melanin. And it turns out for us, the chlorophyll is not a big part of the story. That's the plant side of the story, and food's part of the story. I said, but hemoglobin and melanin, dude, that's the ticket. I said, you need to maximize oxygen delivery, nitric oxide delivery, to melanin to renovate it and to create massive amounts of melanin where your body plan put it in. And I said, I guarantee if you have eosinophilic esophagitis, that the problem is going to be in the visceral level at the hypothalamic level in your brain. I can even tell you the tract it's going to be in. I can tell you where the melanin's missing. I said, so you need to use UVA light and infrared A light through your eye predominantly, and I think it'll go away. So that's what he did. And guess what? Six weeks, it was gone. He, he after having it. this for almost 15 years. Wow. Well, we'll okay. Um, so get, I just think I, I, I gave you how I became 
a decentralized physician. Yeah. That truly was the process. Well, I mean, that what what a what a journey and what an intellectual journey. And I, I, I want to summarize it for the listener um and distill it. And you you let me know, um, Jack, if I if I speak out of turn. But essentially oh, no problem. this this pro this underlying um uh process in the body related to this gene called POMC where exposure to ultraviolet light allowed this critical pathway um in mammals to regulate a whole bunch of 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 uh, bodily processes and that uh, exposure of for the POMC to uv light was a thing that was therefore able to facilitate our transition from these furry underground creatures to these bipedal um primates that later later became humans and and essentially what dr cruz is saying is that the missing piece in conventional medicine functional medicine um medicine that's, that's that only considers diet is that it Naturopath- forget naturopathic any medicine any, any medicine, medicine is missing this it forgets that or, or misses the point that we are beings of light and our physiology and our biology is so fundamentally linked with our light environment um and as dr jack jack said that when we get exposed to the blue light it switches off that pom pathway and we get hyperinsulinemia we get hyperglycemia and we're getting um or contribution to this obesity and metabolic disease epidemic um and and i think the critical point is that prior to 120 years ago when tesla invented the electric grid we only had one source of predominantly of light and the man-made sources of light were simply fire candles um but but realistically we were getting all our light signals from the sun and then since the invention of of the electric grid and we've carrying all these artificial suns in our pockets and and putting them on our walls then that this is when the contribution to disease has become so apparent because now we're disrupting these fundamental um, physiological pathways that rely on light and rely on circadian um signaling so um yeah and the other thing mm-hmm. i think the other thing i think that's really important to hammer home here max because this is what people don't understand. This is linked to our family, meaning family m- mammalia. This is every single mammal has these programs built into them. And it turns out we have the steepest gradient. Why? Because we have the most complex brain. So that means we are subject to mistakes about the light environment most. Mm. Animals below us aren't. And that's the the most counterintuitive part of this story. That's why I like to explain to people, you know, you know from my history that I like calling people out left and right. And the reason why is because I want people to know that a half truth always leads to a full lie. None of this biology that I'm telling you is new. It's been sitting under our noses for hundreds of years. The problem is no one's made sense of why the system is built this way. And part yeah. of the reason for that is medicine has a biochemical focus. What we don't realize is that light is the levers that allow biochemistry to do things it does. So when I make these hyperbolic statements that food is not that important, now you know why I say it. I've also said that what happens on the surface of us is going to turn out to be more important than what happens deep inside us. And when you hear that for the first time in other podcasts I do, it sounds absolutely utter preposterous, but do you know why I do it? I do it because of podcasts like this. You are a doctor. You're a young doctor. I want you to absolutely have your brain scrambled by what I just told you. I want you to go back and prove me wrong because I know when you go down that journey that I went down, you're going to go, holy shit. And then, then you're really going to be the doctor that you signed up for. When you filled out your medical school application, the reason you were altruistic, you are going to find out something very special about mammalian biology. And you are going to be lit on fire because 
all the things that you learned in medical school that like all the chronic diseases that we are terrible at treating can all be fixed when you understand this problem. Yeah. That, that is another hyperbolic statement, but it's that powerful. Yeah. And, and the, the um, I want you to quickly explain um, for the listener, because you mentioned leptin and, and that was at the genesis of this whole story was um, this Amgen rep or um, talking about leptin and the discovery of leptin. I mean, uh, le- leptin is essentially a hormone made by our, our fat cells, but um, can you underneath explain- our skin? underneath our skin um and it, it the way i think about it is that it it basically helps our body um signal how much energy is is on board the the vessel um but I, well that's, you... the, that's the way you can think about it you, you can think about it that way but let's take the story back a little bit further so we we understand what's the main difference between or i shouldn't say the main but what's one of the big differences between chimps and us. Well, chimps are very thin when they're born. Their brains are almost fully developed. Human babies are fatter than shit. They're a a goob of fat and their brains are immature. Okay. Realize that this pathway that defines all this is called the leptin melanocordin pathway. So God or evolution put leptin underneath our sub Q fat to inform our hypothalamus that it needs to make more melanin to actually mature our brain postnatally. That's the thing that defines the human mammal. That's not what defines the chimp. So when you realize that, that, that's one of the things that was my come to Jesus moment. When I found this pathway in the eye called the leptin melanocortin pathway and that it stimulates POMC and it has huge effects in the hypothalamus, I was like, okay, well, where is melanin in this neurosurgical tract. Okay. Now I learned about most of the big tracks, but it turns out the tract that was the single most important was this ancient pathway in all mammals. It's the source of the mammalian dye reflex. It's also the, the source of this pathway in the eye. And I'm pretty good about embryology. You know, as a neurosurgeon, I was top of my class. I did very, very well in embryology. And I remembered that in the eye, there's these really unusual arrangement of the retina. It's, it's backwards. And one of the key things is there's a, something in the eye called Brooks membrane. The RPE, which is the retinal pigmentum epithelium, sits on top of it. And the reason why it's called retinal pigmentum epithelium is because guess what it's filled with? Melanin. And then I found out that in Brooks membrane, there's also an area that has melanin. And then I found out something even more interesting. The choroid plexus in the eye uh, also has melanocytes in it. And I'm going, this cannot be a coincidence. Like I always try to teach my members this. Does nature make mistakes? Are there coincidences in nature? The answer is no to both of those questions. When you're a black swan mitochondriac, you have to go and ask the uncommon question, even when you don't know the answer. So then I found out a couple of very other interesting things about the eye. Turns out that the eye uses a Warburg metabolism. Well, everything I learned about the Warburg metabolism was that it was bad, it was in cancer. Then I found out through my study of biophysics that the eye uses a Warburg metabolism to keep control of vascular proliferation in the eye in certain places. And I was like, that's kind of interesting. Why is it doing that? And it turned out when I distilled it all down that every place in the eye that has melanin was the reason why it was 360 pounds. It was destroying POMSI at the choroid level. And the choroid, for those of you who don't know, is where the blood flow comes into the retina through the ophthalmic artery. And it turns out when I started to look into this, I said to myself, if I'm right about this and leptin is a thermodynamic uh, light generated uh, peptide, I need to find out what the absorption spectrum for leptin is. So I did. And it's 220 nanometers. And I'm like, wait a minute, 220 nanometers. That's below what the sun makes. And I was like, let me keep this to the side. That's an important thing. But I got my answer. It's definitely UVC range, 
Okay. No question about it. So I knew UV light was tied to this melanin story. So then I started to read about but, but sorry, melanin Jack, a little bit more. Jack, UVC doesn't penetrate past the stratosphere. Correct. So you realize why that's a conundrum. Yeah. Then I looked at melatonin. I looked at serotonin. I looked at histidine. I looked at all the aromatic amino acids and I looked at their absorption spectrum. Do you know what I found, Max? Every Wait. single one of them goes from 200 to 400 nanometer light. So the question you just posed to me, don't you find that kind of unusual that serotonin, melatonin, I mean, remember, these are things made in your mitochondria, would use an aromatic amino acid that absorbs light that not even the sun creates. Then it dawned on me the reason why. These mammals evolved 220 million years ago they didn't use the sun. So they had to have some way of creating light inside of them that was stronger than sunlight. And yes, as, as hard as that is for you to hear it the first time, you have no idea how hard it was for me because I figured this out when I looked at the thermodynamic givens of the leptin pathway. And I, I looked at all these chemicals that were involved in it, like dopamine. Like I knew that phenylalanine through phenylalanine hydroxylase formed tyrosine, then tyrosine uh, formed T3 and T4 in the pituitary, and that tyrosine can also form L-dopa, and then L-dopa, which is also an amino acid that can then form melanin, dopamine, or noradrenaline. So I saw the whole thing laid out, and I'm going, I have to figure out how that happened. So I looked up phenylalanine and, and tyrosine's absorption spectra, 200 to 400 nanometer light. I'm like, son of a bitch. Then when I started to look in about melanin, then I found out that melanin, because it's dark, absorbs everything, meaning from RF radiation all the way up to cosmic level radiation. And that's what defines a black semiconductor. It absorbs all frequencies of light. And I'm going, wait a minute. This means, this is the reason why, like NAD positive, which is um, cytochrome 1 in mitochondria, is made out of this aromatic amino acid. Melanin, there must be a process in the body that creates light. So that's when I jumped down another rabbit hole. I went and looked through the literature, and don't you think I found a paper from 1923 by a guy named Alexander Gerwich, who did this really simple uh, experiment where he took an onion root, cut the onion root in half, and was able to stimulate mitosis in another cell. And he called that process mitogenic radiation. He had no idea what it was because back in those days, they didn't have a spectroscope or a, a photomultiplier. But he said there is some type of release in one side of this root that can stimulate the other side to begin to grow. So he was pretty ingenious researcher. He put all different materials between it. And when he put glass between it, he stopped the ability to cause mitosis in the other side. Then when he put a piece of quartz in there, it actually allowed the process to go. So he knew immediately that he was dealing with UV light immediately. So, when I read that, I was like, okay, so basically what this guy's saying, that cells release UV light to signal. I said, now this story is getting even more interesting. Then I jumped down another rabbit hole. Remember, this is 1923. A guy in the 1960s shows up who's a, bot, is, who's a physicist. His name is Fritz Pop. Fritz Pop got very, very interested in this extreme low-frequency UV light that all cells seem to release. So back in the 60s, they had this, the, the machines that Gerwich didn't have. So Pop got the idea to take every single living cell and put it in a photomultiplier. And guess what he found? Every single cell, irrespective of where it comes from, releases extreme low frequency UV light. So UVC, and it turns out that UV light is needed. UVC, not huh? UVA or B. UVC, not A. No, no. He, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't know. He didn't know what the frequencies were because the amount of light that our cells release is so small, it's really hard to sample the frequency. 
Okay. But one of the things that he did tease out, it looked like it was UVB, uh, UVA light predominantly. That's what it looked like. But the key factor that he found was that every living cell does it. And here's where it gets more interesting, Max. It turns out that mitochondrial respiration varies the frequency and the intensity of the UV light that's created. When I found that out, I was like, now this is really interesting. This means that there has to be a mechanism in us to create a spectrum of light inside of us. I said, mammals are doing the impossible. They have an ability inside of them. And I, I kept going back 65 million years ago. I'm like, this is the reason why mammals were able to live under the ground eight or nine months out of the year and hibernate because yeah, they were back, making light inside themselves. Back to the furry critters. This they is were, what they, they were surviving because they were endogenously making their own ultraviolet light. Correct. Absolutely correct. And then it turned out that I figured out the way they were doing it is they were using wideband semiconductors to do it. And do you know how I figured that out? This is probably the coolest part of the, the story. I asked myself one question. I said, what's the entire food web on the planet linked to? Photosynthesis, right, Max? Yeah. I said, do I understand food properly? Like this story with the mammals, they're making their own sugar. I said, what about the food story? So then I looked at the first ionization energy of, of uh, water. I said, because, you know, in third grade, I learned CO2 plus water and sunlight makes sugar. You know, I think everybody knows that that's not like uh, mind bending stuff. But the real interesting part of the story is when I actually looked up the biophysics of the first ionization energy. What does that mean in English for your listeners and not bent in science? It means how does photosynthesis charge separate water into hydrogen, oxygen, and two electrons? Because it turns out that's the first step in photosynthesis. That's when I found out that the first ionization energy of water on planet Earth is 12.04 electron volts. I'm like, hold on a minute. So I pulled out my calculator and I figured out that 12.4 electron volts is equivalent to 98 nanometer light. That's soft x-rays. That's actually below UVC light. I'm going, wow. how in the hell are we making food? To charge separate water, if we have to have soft x-rays to do it, and I know soft x-rays aren't on planet Earth, this makes no sense at all. That's how I solve for X. Asking that counterintuitive question brought me to chlorophyll. And I looked at chlorophyll. And what's in the center of chlorophyll? Magnesium. And it's surrounded by a nitride cage. And I'm like, son of a bitch. So what did I do? I looked up the band gap of magnesium. And guess what I found? It's over eight. And when you put it in a nitride cage, it can get up to nine. So then I thought about the band gap of sun. So solar frequencies from 250 to 760 on the planet goes from 1.7 to 3.1 electron volts. So I did simple addition. I said, you know what's happening? We're using visible light and wideband semiconductors to charge separate water. That's exactly the mechanism. I got my answer of what mammals were really doing. And then I looked at the periodic table. And then I opened my biology book and I said, this is the reason why every single thing in cells uses sodium, uh, calcium, magnesium, potassium, uh, and nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. I said, these are all wideband semiconductors and they're all doped by specific atoms. I'm like, think about ATP. What is the P in ATP? It's phosphorus. What is all uh, the glycoamino glycans that are present in the retina? They're all sulfated. What about cholesterol? It's also sulfated. I'm going, dude, this is this, this whole story is a story of light. It's a story of nonlinear optics. It's, it's a story that mammals in our family, they fucking figured out how to create light stronger than the sun while they're under the ground. And they're doing it basically by using wideband semiconductors to create LED light inside us. But here's the key part of the story. Then I finally figured out what melanin's purpose was. It was condensed matter screen that absorbed every frequency 
of light that comes from these conductors. So I found out if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, melanin can absorb everything, even unbelievable amounts of radiation. You know, technically, uh, it can absorb microwaves, it can absorb uh, gamma rays. And I'm going, this is absolutely incredible. So melanin was the key to the mammal story. The more melanin they had, then I thought about where the early mammals had melanin. It was in their skin and their hair. And then I thought about Gerwich's um, paper that you can only have mitosis uh, when you have UV light. And I said, well, wait a minute. If photosynthesis was disrupted for these little mammals, what would have happened if there was no UV light around to their, to their melanin and, their, and, the, and the melanin in their skin? I said, how did they do this? I said, I got it. I just figured it out. Without UV light, they basically took the melanin from their outside and began to absorb it on the inside. And the path that it, that worked on, Max, goes back to what you learned in embryology and probably in, in neurology and neurosurgery. We have neuroplasticity. Your brain and your skin, where melanin predominantly comes from, and your teeth, because your enamel is also a neuroectodermal derivative, uh, they remain connected in the adult form. They're connected by neural pathways, but what else connects them, Max, that you know about? Vitamin A and vitamin D. So I said, I know that vitamin D. Fat soluble. It's cholesterol. Fat soluble vitamins. Right. And it, it basically vitamin D is a chemical that connects the two via the bloodstream. Uh, and you need 312 nanometer light to do that. And then I looked up the absorption spectrum of vitamin A, which is really important for the RXR receptor in the brain. And it's 328 nanometers. I'm going, dude, this is making total sense to me now. So we're using vitamin D for the skin, vitamin A for the brain. That's the biochemistry, how it connects. I said, but the wideband semiconductors, this explains the reason why all the aromatic amino acids that were selected by evolution all absorb UVC light, because that's what we're making inside from our wideband semiconductors. And I said, we're carbon-based, but it turns out the metals that we're doped with was the key. And I said, the screen that absorb all, all this light is melanin. And it's buried in Pomsi, and it's been staring me right in the face Dude, when I figured all this out, I was like, holy shit. This is the, the coolest story I've ever seen in my life because it explained everything about how these furry little creatures were able to survive when dinosaurs couldn't. And, and Jack, tell and me, the so thing Jack, that, Jack, tell me, what, what part of the cell is this ultraviolet light being emitted from? Where are these wide-band semiconductors? The mitochondria. Is it from the mitochondria oh, itself? Mitochondria, but yeah, it's the mitochondria and also from DNA. DNA is effectively a UV light antenna. It emits as it's translating. It, it, the, everything in biochemistry is controlled by nonlinear optics. Everything. That means that you need to know what nonlinear optics is capable of. So, for example, there's fancy terms like you'd be shocked to find out that you can take uh infrared a light and you can turn it into light that's blue meaning that it's way stronger that's effectively what happens at cytochrome number two with the flavins um you'd also be shocked to know that you can take uv light like uva light 380 nanometers and you can turn it in to 200 and 220 nanometer light so that you could stimulate both melatonin and leptin in the body mm. and that's exactly what's going on yeah and that's why leptin had the 220 nanometer um absorption spectrum because it turns out if you think about it teleologically chimps don't have their sub q fat underneath their skin but we do and the reason why is because our skin is basically a solar panel for the energy hog in our head so it makes total sense why the subcutaneous fat levels there. So what did I do when I was a fat ass? I said, it must mean that white fat, meaning white adipocytes, have to have melanin in them. Guess what I found? They do. Palm C's in there. I was like, shit, this, this makes total sense now. So the energy accountant really is leptin because it is accounting for the UV light creation from 
the semiconductors inside of us. And what's happening at the hypothalamic level is how much melanin is absorbing this light information. And then this is distributed through the rest of the, the, the central nervous system, you know, in order to get a good thermodynamic response. So I realized right away that fat people were fat not because they ate too much. It's because they were losing energy to the environment. It was exactly the opposite. Mm. Then I thought about physics. I said, does this make sense? You know, what I'm figuring out here in my head, like I'm, I'm giving you all the different thought experiments that I did in these 18 months. Yeah. I said, when you have heart failure, Matt, does the heart get bigger or smaller? So the heart gets, gets bigger, larger. Right? It gets larger. Right. So, so then when a star dies, does a star get bigger or smaller? It gets larger. It's bigger. Yeah. Fails in a supernova. When your patients, Max, in Australia, sprain their ankle, does it get bigger or smaller? It, do, it does get larger, yeah. Okay, so did you, did you notice that the three examples I just gave you, that none of these are controversial, that when a system loses energy, it always gets bigger? So maybe fat people have the same problem. And that's when I had my Eureka. I was like, I got this. I think I know how to fix myself. I said, I need to go in the sun and I need to cool myself. And I said, I need to do it specifically so that I'm making sure that I always hit the transition of sunrise to UVA light based on the latitude I am. Guess what I did? I did it. It worked. I, and, I didn't and let, even believe it was going to work. And let me explain for the listener, because we, we've gone very, very deep. But what Jack was saying is that the reason leptin is so important is that it is integrating and receiving that energy information from the the and the light information from the, the cells that is integrating that with all the other energy information in in the body. Um, is that is that would you say that's correct, Jack? Yeah, I would. Yeah. So so the, what 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 Jack's proposing is it's a more holistic model of the body's energy balance but also maybe a master hormone because it's integrating the light signals both the external light signals because obviously this this leptin is is being produced in the in the fat cells just under the skin but it's also integrating that subcellular or cellular light signals that are happening um, inside that's being emitted from the mitochondria. And then it's feeding that information back to the brain um, through the hypothalamus. Is that correct, Jack? Yep. So so that is the really crux hard. of what really Jack not is... not that hard to understand when you see it all laid out for you. Yeah. So the crux of the issue is that the reason why light is so important to health is because it is modulating the the, the signal that we're using to, to maintain our energy state through, through leptin and through the leptin um, melanocorticoid po cortican pathway that he was just mentioning. So, and then through that is POMC, which you, uh, which you, we, we were explained to earlier. POMC um, is the key driver. Hmm. POMC is the key driver for this whole pathway because without melanin, the system doesn't work. And that's yeah. really the come to Jesus moment for me. So the that's question I realized hmm. that everything about, biology is I need to find out every place that POMC is made, yeah. every cell line, and then start looking at different diseases. So that's what I did. And then what did I find out? I found out that most of the diseases that Flamux centralized medicine, I could fix if I just figured out the neural pathway of between ectoderm in the head and on the skin. Because here's the cool part of the story that I still haven't told you. This is the part I think you're going to like, Max. Okay. Because of Gerwitz's story, I knew that cells divide with this mitogenic radiation, which was UV light. So if you're following my story really good, Max, and I'm, I'm putting this on you now, not the listener, what one question would you want to ask me about this KT event and about us right now? Well, what? since you didn't ask, I'm going to tell you. Well, no, the hang number on, one hang question on. I have. Don't, don't, don't tell me. So I, the question that was on my mind before you raised this point was, do reptiles express POMC in the same way that mammals do? No, that's not what I was interested in. This is totally a mammal story. 
Okay. When I say this to you, you'll understand why I said it. I said the books, the evolutionary biology books say this is a hundred to a thousand year transition for the asteroid. I'm like, there's no way mammals could have lived that long to make it through. I said, this process has to happen faster than we all think. And then I thought about the transition from chimp to ape. Everybody thought that took a long time. I'm saying, what if that's not true? What if melanin was able to do this way faster than we think? So how did I figure this out? I went to an African-American patient who had vitiligo. And I said, I now know that I can repigment your skin. I just need to know how fast it can happen. I said, would you agree to let me try to repigment your skin? And I went to one of my dermatology con uh, uh, colleagues and I said, send me a patient that you're having a lot of trouble with. And she did. And if you follow my work, any of my blogs, there's this picture of this lady that I always show. And she was African-American, overweight woman who had gray hair. Her hair was shaved, but she had really bad facial vitiligo. <clears throat> In six weeks, I fixed her. And vitiligo for the listener and is a loss of, loss of melanin, loss of pigmentation in the skin. Just, yeah, just think about Michael Jackson. That's the easiest yeah. way to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Just it's it's basically the story of Michael Jackson. And you know, in this lady's history, I found out she used sunscreen all the time. She always used sunglasses, hardly ever went out with her surface exposed. And the crazy thing is when I used the UV light to bring the, the melanocytes back in, she also had some metabolic issues, and those metabolic issues were made worse. And I thought, oh, this is unusual. And then I thought about it. I said, no, it's not. I said, now I think I, I really figured it out. She was actually pulling the melanocytes from inside her head out to the skin where the UV light was. And I said, that means there's neuroplasticity between the neuroectoderm. I said, and the reason that she got metabolically worse is because she didn't have enough palm C on the inside. So I knew immediately that this could happen really fast. So I told her implicitly, I said, look, if now that we've repigmented your skin, if you continue to stay in the sun like you've done, and obviously I had buy-in now because the number one problem she went to the dermatologist was she didn't like the way her face looked. I said, look, I think I can make your diabetes and your obesity go away if you continue to stay in the sun and we can rebuild the palm C in your hypothalamus through this leptin melanocortin pathway. Well, guess what? She wound up losing 80 pounds and her type 2 diabetes went completely away. The other crazy part of the story, I didn't anticipate this. I told you she had gray hair on the picture that I always show. Her hair got melanin back in it, so it was dark. Wow. So yeah. I realized right away that the things that we learned in neurosurgery, at least I learned, you're younger than me. I learned that neuroectoderm didn't have a lot of neuroplasticity. It turned out that it does. We now know definitively in the last 10 or 15 years that uh, the adult brain is way more plastic than we think. But the thing that I found out is that melanin is super duper uh, inducible with UV light. That, that answered the question for me that I had with the mammals. I said, that means they, as soon as they came out when the dinosaurs were dead, they started pulling their melanin inside their brains. That's what fueled mammalian brain evolution. And you remember, I'm a brain surgeon. That's what I'm interested in. That absolutely blew my mind. And then I immediately jumped 65 million years in advance. And I said, this explains the transition to chimp to human. Because we shouldn't, if I'm right about this, we shouldn't have a big change in our genes mm. at all. Yeah. And it turned out when the Human Genome Project came out in 96, we didn't. We had exactly the same number. And that's when I realized that um, the game here was we had to pull from our surface. Like any disease where you're pulling melanin from inside your head to outside is going to be devastating. That's exactly what MS is doing. That's yeah. exactly what melanoma is. I mean, if you really understand this, melanoma is melanin cells in your brain coming to the surface because you can't create any... VUV light deep inside your head because the system is completely broken because you've blocked it for yeah. so long. And here's the crazy part, Max, to because I know there's going to be other doctors that listen to this, and I'm sure you're listening to this, and this is beyond your belief, but I'm going to prove to you just how correct I am. 
that this process still works in you. You learned in medical school a, a, a thing about white blood cells called diapedesis, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The process of... Um... Okay. So do you know why white blood cells are able to migrate into tissues? It's exactly the same thing as metastasis does. Do you know how it happens? You may not know this, but white blood cells are loaded with POMC. And it turns out the cytoplasm where POMC is located gets turned off in these cells. So that allows them to migrate. In other words, cells cannot migrate unless my, uh, mitosis is turned off. That means you have to turn off UV light release to maintain neuroplasticity. This is still seen in our immune cells today. Mm. And guess what happens when you, the, the, the white blood cell gets to the tissue where the bacteria is emitting light, that emission of light activates mitosis in the white cell to clear the infection. That's actually how it works. So I realized right away that, metas that metastasis is actually a mammalian innovation. And we use it in our immune system to this very day. And the evidence is still present in our melanocytes because we can move our melanocytes. But here's why it, this is such a counterintuitive thing. You know that the paradigm of cancer in centralized medicine is that, well, mitosis is bad in cancer. Turns out that's not true. It's exactly the opposite. When a cell can't divide is when it becomes very mobile. That's what metastasis effectively is. So we have everything completely backward. And if you think about chemotherapeutic drugs, every single drug is targeted at mitosis at some level. So if you really understand what I'm saying, we're doing everything wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, and this I is why you see all those things that I, I post and people in Australia lose their mind. I'm like, the, the vaccine for... Melanoma, the vaccine for skin cancer is UV light. It's it's on the surface, it sounds so crazy. Yeah. Until you understand what I told you in the last hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And um I, I want to make a distinct section where we go over the pathology and how it relates to to light. But suffice to say, the, the melanoma patients that I've encountered in the clinic and in the emergency department, um, you know, I took a detailed history from them and um, overwhelmingly they didn't go in the sun. Um, they were overweight. They That's the um, fastest way to get melanoma. Yeah. They had That's a, the reason why people in Australia have it. Yeah. You guys um, you guys stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah. And, and look, and Jack, they, what about, and, I, and I, maybe we'll talk about this another time, but I quickly want to make the mention of omega-6 fatty acids and linoleic acid in the skin. I mean, empirically, people reduce the linoleic acid content of their diet and their skin burning ability goes down. They become more resistant to, to sunburn. So surely that that's got a role too in, in the development of melanoma and It's skin got a cancer. role, but it's not as big a role as you think. Yeah. It's got a role, but it's not as big as you think. Yeah. yeah. Because, I, I will uh, tell you that the, the single best the single best thing that you can do is you got to use red light from the sun, like from sunrise to the transition of UVA, wherever you are in your, your latitude. What people don't realize is that uh, red light preconditions your skin for UV. Yeah. This is the reason why morning light is irreplaceable. I, I always tell people when I do podcasts, they always say, Jack, give us your one actionable task. The actionable task is you need to harvest as much red light as you possibly can when you have atrophic skin. Like, for example, Max, I want you, hopefully, when you examine all this and jump down the rabbit hole, realize that just about everybody in Australia, just think about the evolutionary biology of Australia. You guys, none of you belong in Australia. You all came there through imperialism. You're Northern European. Your haplotypes all support that. You guys all have atrophic white skin. That's the reason why the Aborigines look so different than you. They're yeah. built perfectly for Australia and you're not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you have to realize when I say atrophic skin, I'm not just talking about thin. I'm talking about you have no melanin anywhere. Like Australian women are all blonde hair, blue eyes. That means their exteriors are devoid of palm seed. And then what do you do? Then you put sunglasses, sunscreen, and clothes on 
even yeah. more. Yeah, and 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 we can go real deep into exactly why that so um, doesn't doesn't make sense. But I want to really tie a bow on the light story because we we we're really close to um, I guess p- piecing some big p- pieces together. So we've talked about basically humans as creatures of light, and what what Jack's told you is that uh, and explained is that not only do we ha- are we adapted to receiving external light sources through our eyes and our central retinal pathways and how that influence uh, influences leptin and our sensing of body energy. But what Jack is also saying, which is a critical point, is that cells use light that is made in the mitochondria to signal to each other in terms of when to divide um, and, and when to replicate DNA and all, all these kinds of things. Um, so to me, and and someone who's trying to understand this as best I can, um, this is a story of external light and a story of internal light. Does that it's make a sense? story of light completely. Yeah. Completely. And, and, and the thing you that said, we haven't talked about. when we started this podcast, mm. you wanted to talk about light. Yeah. Dude, we're talking about light. That's we're all talk- we're talking about we're here. We're talking about light. And the critical thing we haven't talked about yet which i really we need to go deep into is the mitochondria because the mitochondria um as we've just said emit light but they also receive light because they have these cytochromes that are light and environmental sensors so jack what is what is a mitochondrion what singular mitochondrion plural mitochondria um what are they there are the energy uh powerhouses of the cell that basically take electromagnetic energy and turn it into not only light, but also the DC electric current that Becker found. And it does that through a nonlinear process called ferroelectricity. It also is piezoelectric, meaning that all of the um, things that a mitochondria collects, that is basically subatomic particles, electrons and protons, that have half nuclear spin, mitochondria wants to collect those. The reason why it wants to collect those is because it turns it into almost a metal plasma. That's what's inside the mitochondria. And this generates one mitochondria across the intermitochondrial membrane because it's only six angstroms uh, big, can generate almost 30 million volts of electricity um, through oxidative metabolism. And this is really the main energy source of light. Uh, The main energy source of life that Max and I learned in in medical school is ATP. ATP is important in this pathway, but that's the fifth cytochrome, the ATPase, um, that basically reestablishes phosphate uh, as one of the dopants in the semiconductors inside of our bodies. It's important for light emission, not as we've learned about it in biochemistry. And ultimately, without phosphate, many of the proteins that Max and I have learned about in biochemical pathways effectively don't work. In fact, if you sat down and looked, like if we just talked about the opsin pathway or the pathway of melanin, you'll find out there's a signaling transduction pathway called MAPK, that uses rhodopsin, vitamin A, and phosphate. There's a double phosphorylation that happens. When you hear this, because I know most of you are listening to this, don't understand biochemistry as well as probably Max and I do, but this is more from Max's standpoint. I want Max to realize just how much he doesn't know. No, I'm acutely aware. I'm acutely aware, Jack. But the key thing is we've been told so many bullshit lies in yeah. medicine. Yeah. And when you actually understand truly what phosphorus is doing and how phosphorus works, and then you look in to like the physics of phosphorus, like look at its band gap, look what it does as a dopant. You begin to realize that most things made out of phosphorus fluoresce. And then you go, okay, now I, now I get why biology's, using phosphorus so much. And then when you look at hemoglobin and chlorophyll and you go, look at this, they're surrounded by the same nitrogen cage. And then you look at all of our tissues, like the extracellular matrix, everything is sulfated. Like in other words, you keep seeing the same thing over and over Mm -hmm. and over Mm -hmm. again. 
And you begin to realize what nature is really doing. She is amplifying solar signals to stronger light to run everything in our physiology. That is the story of mammals. That actually defines us uh, more than reptiles and amphibians. Yeah. And it turns out that uh, when you begin to see all these processes in us, you realize as a centralized physician, how much do you really know about light? How much do you really know about electrons? Yeah. How much do you know about protons? See, that was what my come to Jesus moment was at this thing. I said, I clearly don't understand mitochondria the way I need to understand mitochondria. And then I began to understand what the real purpose of the vitamin D system was, it's actually to create a Faraday cage on the outside of our body to protect every subatomic particle in mitochondria so that they could be coherent. And once, once you create a coherence inside of every mitochondria in your body, that means that you can use other quantum processes like entanglement. And we now know that entanglement happens in biologic tissues. And and this is confounded uh, physics researchers because they fundamentally don't believe quantum processes can happen in warm, wet environments. And what am I telling you? I, I found it 20 years ago. And in 2007, it was proven definitively that quantum processes happen in photosynthesis. We now know it happens in magnetoreception of the European robin. We now know that it happens in melanin. I mean, most of you probably don't know this, but... Uh, People in Silicon Valley that are trying to build quantum com computers are now using graphene, which is another carbon-based um, uh, material that has unusual topologic processes. Yeah. What else are they using? They're using melanin. They found out melanin can do things that even graphene can't do. And it turns out biology has found this out probably a billion years ago yeah. and has been refining these processes in us. And it turns out the family that we come from, the little itty bitty creatures under the ground that were really almost a biologic novelty in the age of dinosaurs, just so they could stay underground and live. It turned out when the conditions of existence changed from the asteroid, that's, that truly was their niche. Yeah. That yeah. allowed yeah. them to do things that are almost unfathomable. Yeah. And that is the story of us. Yeah. We are we are the last iteration in this process. Yeah. And and we we we're really painting a very very deep picture of the evolution of of humans all the way back from those fur little creatures in the ground. Um and you made a comment about the development of the human brain and particularly the transition point from when we were chimps to when we became Homo sapiens, the stat, you know, the the wise man standing upright and and with his massive cranium. Um, there are several theories within science and within the more um, certain areas of science that uh, things like consumption of bone marrow um, was was key to enlarging this this um, this I'm encephalization. You, it's all so 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 it's all bullshit. Know, so t talk to us and the and I know. Is the absorption, the absorption of melanin inside your skull is the entire story. And I'm going to prove this to you very simply. Okay. You're a doctor in Australia. Do you want to see cognitive de-evolution? Go look at a human who never goes in UV light. You'll see somebody with uh, cardiac disease, peripheral artery disease, and neurodegeneration. It's the reverse. When you lose melanin in those key spots in your head, you are de-evolving. You're seeing yeah. the process in reverse. So what? what That's about, exactly what's happening. Okay, but what about nutrients? So, I mean, I mean, you've talked a lot about DHA, which is um, an omega three fatty acid, and specifically animal derived DHA, which is in what's called an SN two position. So, you've talked previously that that particular nutrient was key in in I guess concentrating in our in our central nervous system and kind of in enabling this this transition. So how do you think about that nu nutrient versus, say, other fatty acids in bone marrow or, or animal food? Well, you have, to, you have to understand evolutionary history 
from a very blown out perspective. So let me explain this to you. 50 million years before the Cambrian explosion, the first wideband semiconductor on Earth was chlorophyll. That created photosynthesis. Photosynthesis drove oxygen transition in the great oxidation event. Uh, the next thing that evolved was hemoglobin. And we've evolved hemoglobin multiple, multiple times. That's why there's hundreds, thousands of different types of hemoglobins. Hemoglobins then were able to deliver this oxygen directly to tissues. What also happened at that same time? After the KT event, the biggest wideband semiconductor became melanin. So those three semiconductors are big. Where does DHA fit in the story? DHA uh, was created by the photosynthetic event in the in the ocean. So once photosynthesis was made, DHA was created in the ocean system. Uh, once it was there, the whole point of DHA is that it acts like, um, I guess, electrons on a wire. That's the way you should think about it. And for people who don't understand the, the fundamentals of DHA, it basically is the key part that runs a non-linear optic system. You need to have high fidelity electron uh, movement in a semiconductive system. And that's predominantly what DHA does. So the difference between the older domains of life, like bacteria and archaea, compared to eukaryotes, eukaryotes have put DHA in every single membrane except one. The only membrane that it's not in is the inner mitochondrial membrane, which still remains of bacterial origin for us. Uh, and that's where all the cytochrome proteins are. So the key point for DHA, it, it evolved about 600 million years ago. It's the only fatty acid on planet Earth that hasn't been replaced one time in mammalian brains. That's what makes it uber special. That's the reason why I have fundamentally told everybody DHA is irreplaceable in the story. But remember, it's not the primary story. Melanin is the primary story. But the way DHA works is it's a ferry boat of electrons to bring light to the system. And that's not my law. That's Einstein's photoelectric effect that he won the Nobel Prize for in 1922. The, the queerness uh, for us to realize is that since DHA has been around for 600 million years, it's in just about every mammal line. Every mammal runs this program, but humans have a very unusual DHA story. Their story is that they have more DHA in their central retinal pathways than they do in the rest of their brain. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is because circadian biology becomes way more important when you add real estate to your brain upstairs, meaning when you went from chimp to human and you added two frontal lobes, you had to have supreme control over this new real estate that you created in your brain. Yeah. And it turns out that the circadian control, it's an optical lattice clock in your SCN. Is so SCN is supraclasmatic nucleus for the listener. It's um, Jack, can you quickly explain the SCN so that people have context? Yeah, it's pretty easy. Uh, the SEN is part of the optic system in the brain. It's connected directly to the central retinal pathways. But the way I like to describe it to people so they get it, I want you to think about your iPhone. Your iPhone has uh, Google Maps on it. When you want to go to, I don't know, say a cafe in Sydney or Melbourne, uh, you plug in the address and you're able to get there no problem. Everybody uses it. What you don't know is the physics behind it. The physics behind it works on special and general relativity. So up in the air, Garmin or the government has um, a satellite that runs 38 um, microseconds faster than the computer in your iPhone that does this. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because of general and special relativity. So the clock above you has to work faster than, than the clock below you. Yeah. This is the reason why nature put the SEN in our eye, because it's generally at the top of our body plan, and it's not at the bottom where our feet are. And the same thing is true in the iPhone that works in us. So that means if you want all the biochemicals in your body to get to the right place, your circadian biology has to be pristine. Yeah. So the way in which nature did that is to make sure that the central retinal pathways has more electrons in it 
than any other part of your brain because the electrons bring the light energy to the SEN. Yeah. That's so, the story of the SEN. It's like, so it's like you're using DHA in this pathway is the equivalent of making the highest quality highway. You're using the best quality concrete Correct. and the best smoothest concrete. And you spend all this time making sure that that is the flattest, smoothest road. And you, you put all the cobblestones and the, and the bitumen using it in other places. But for this critical function, you want that highway, which is the central retinal pathway from your eye to your brain, to be the highest quality pavement. And that's what the DHA is doing. Absolutely. It's, mm -hmm. it's doing that and a whole lot more. I mean, we could really get into the nuance, but I, don't, I think for this type of podcast, this is the 80,000 foot view of actually how the system of biology really works. Yeah, yeah. The nuance, when you really want to get into the nuance, I mean, I could split your head open. No, that's a, yeah. I don't no, think that's, that's, that's okay. really. No, 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 we're doing yeah, good. I don't think that's important. Yeah, yeah, no, we're doing good. So we've explained DHA, um, we've explained the central retinal pathways. And a point that I really want to emphasize for people is these photo, the different photoreceptors because people know that, or they might have a, a brief understanding that, that we sense light through different photoreceptors in our eye. But what they don't know is, which they might not know, is that there's certain photoreceptors that don't sense light per se, but they sense the absence. <coughs> they sense the, the um, they're, they're basically clock timing cells. So can you just explain that a little bit so that we've got a bit of a background as well to this light story? And, and yeah, I mean, and I think the easiest way to explain this is to understand the opsin system, because yeah. I will tell you, centralized biology doesn't get it. So since you're from Australia and I'm, I'm assuming your audience is going to be Australian, I want to offend their beliefs really, really good. So let's talk about neuropsin. Neuropsin is a special opsin that's found in your cornea and your skin. It's a UVA light detector. As soon as you find out that it responds to UVA, UVA light, that should be enough for you to question your dermatologist and your primary care doctor say, wait a minute. Does nature make mistakes? Why in the hell would we have a UVA light detector in our eye or our skin if somehow UV light wasn't important? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, when you go and have LASIK surgery, uh, the surgeon doesn't see neuropsin on your cornea. So the question is, what happens when you get rid of neuropsin? Well, it turns out neuropsin is really important for this leptin melanocortin pathway. Uh, and are there, are there things distal in the eye that go awry that can happen? Yeah. We now know that there's many people who have LASIK surgery, they get really bad depression. And it turns out that when you disrupt the neuropsins in your eyes, it can affect the other photoreceptors in the eye below, which is melanopsin, which is located in the periphery of the retina. Uh, and if you don't know, Max, why it's in the periphery, again, I'm going to come back to you. Nature never makes mistakes. Melanopsin is not in the front. And the reason why is what frequency of light bends the most in the eye? Blue light. This is the reason why melanopsin is found there. Not only that, melanopsin also tends to be in the inferior part of the retina, not the top part. So these blue light receptors are there and they go to a nucleus in the brainstem called the habenular nucleus. This whole pathway from your cornea all the way through your eye into the habenial nucleus is loaded with palm C. So if you zap this with a laser, the signaling, the optical signaling is disrupted and someone can develop depression in two or three weeks and kill themselves. Wow. From LASIK surgery. So when you hear this story and you're from Australia, you're like, oh my God, um, I don't get too crazy about that because I don't want to piss off too many of the ophthalmologists, but I like to talk about contacts. I like to talk about sunglasses and how bad they are because they do the same thing, except they have much more wide frequency things because contacts blocks oxygen. What happens when we block oxygen? Fundamentally on the story that I've already told you. Uh, it affects uh, mitochondrial function, uh, and it affects calcium flows inside the mitochondria. I told you calcium is a wide-band semiconductor. 
that's what calcium efflux is. So when you're hypoxic at any level, what are you doing to the physics of the system? You're decreasing the power of the light that you can make inside. In other words, instead of having VUV light, which is 200 to 400 nanometer light, now you're only making, say, 330. And that has huge effects for anything that's made out of phenylalanine, tyrosine, um, tryptophan, or histidine. And when you look at that picture I always show people, you begin to realize, hey, melatonin is one of those things. Serotonin is one of those things. So the NAD positive is one of those things. Neurotransmitters that you right. need for oh. your mood. Correct. Dopamine is one of those things. Uh, uh, acetylcholine, epinephrine, nicotine. Like you're starting to see all the neurotransmitters made in your brain are fundamentally tied to this. So when you hear this nonsense that all these alternative practitioners, like there's a chemical imbalance. No, there's a frequency imbalance in the light that mm -hmm. you live in. Mm -hmm. That's what really is the story. Yeah. And this is the reason why um, when you hear a lot of my podcasts or you hear me um, do things, sometimes I sound like a raving lunatic. The reason why is because I'm so passionate about understanding this stuff really well. When I hear a dumbass talk about it, which is pretty much what most of the centralized paradigm is, it infuriates me. It infuriates me that I saw this 20 years ago. I saw the issue with POMC. Uh, I, I've been posting pictures on the internet that kind of show you how this pathway works. And nobody's asking the right questions. Yeah. And to translate and that. It's yeah. And to, sorry, Jack, to translate that for the listener, what Jack is saying is that the manifestation of neurotransmitter disruption, i.e. anxiety or depression or any other, many other psychiatric conditions are a, a resulting from or contributed by um, disruptions in light through the eye because those, those critical neurotransmitters and other hormones that we just uh, discussed, um, their synthesis is regulated um, by um, those correct light signals. So when we're blue light toxic, when we've been looking at um, an iPad the whole time, um, when we're, we're not making, um, not sending those, those uh, circadianly appropriate signals, then you get things like psychiatric problems. Yeah, I, I, just about every psychiatric disease, like I, I try to explain to people that executive function and uh, mood disorders, most of them run through the frontal lobe uh, circuits. All of them are tied to defects of melanin. So I like to think about psychiatric disease from schizophrenia to depression, like a bowling alley. Those are the boundaries of the frontal lobe. And the interesting thing is, Depression is always associated with low dopamine and schizophrenia is always associated with high dopamine that's released in a very chaotic fashion. Mm -hmm. All other mental disorders are between those two and they're all defined by defects in uh, the melanocortin pathway through the eye uh, and not just through the eye because you said this, Max, the listener should also know that some of them are, are critical with the skin too. Why? Because remember the skin mm -hmm is neuroectodermal derivative. So if you're getting a different frequency from your eye and your brain than you are on your skin, that also creates chaos in the system. So this is the reason why clothing, sunglasses, sunscreens, they're all problematic. Yeah. Everything is problematic. When you yeah. understand how the system is built and when you understand how key the POMC protein cleavage is, because the way in which cells cleave POMC is wholly dependent on light frequencies you get. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and yeah, that's, that's, I was just going to say, that's the key to understanding. Like uh, when I just did this podcast with Andrew Uberman and Rick Rubin, one of the things that we talked about, I, I said, you know, it's amazing to me that <clears throat> modern biologists don't realize we have more melanopsin in our brain than any other animal on the planet. And it's got to make you wonder why in the hell would God or evolution put a blue light detector everywhere through our brain? Well, it turns out that frequency signal through the eye, through the inferior peripheral part of the retina is important. And Max, I, I tell you this because this is coming in, in future blog posts that I write. You'll be shocked to know. I've known this for 20 years. 
But research is just proving my point is the fastest way for you to create neurodegeneration is to get damage to the peripheral part of the retina. And you know how we know that? You know that diabetic retinopathy uh, can lead to retinal tears. They can lead to myopia. They can lead to glaucoma. Yeah. And where these bleeds happen, the AV nicking and the AV shunting, always, always happens in the peripheral retina. What do the retinal surgeons do? They use lasers to photocoagulate. They usually put 800 to 1,200 holes in the retina to stick it back to the back of the eye so it'll stop bleeding. Do you know that when you have that procedure done in the peripheral retina, that you're 1.7 to 2.7 times more likely to develop neurodegeneration down the road? Max, hopefully you're beginning to understand why that happens because what effectively you're doing is you're affecting that melanopsin signaling pathway from the eye all the way directly into uh, the frontal and temporal lobes to set you up for either Alzheimer's with protein neurofibrillary tangles. In other words, when the protein bends the wrong way, what are you doing? You're changing the optics. Yeah. Uh, in Parkinson's, it's easier to understand because it's melanin disruption in the basal ganglion. Yeah. Frontal yeah. temporal dysplasia is just like Alzheimer's disease. But people fundamentally need to understand that when you mess with the optics that you come into this world with, you're gonna pay a biologic toll. This is the reason why Australians, they really need this story, this podcast yeah. that I'm doing with you. Yeah. This would be the most popular podcast ever in the history of Australia. Why? <laughs> it explains to you exactly the reason why the things that are going on in Australia are going on. And when you consider yeah. the evolutionary biology of Australia, where you all came from, and that you all are melanin deficient, yet you live on a desert in the middle of the Southern Ocean, um, you begin to understand this is no shock that we have towns like Darwin where there's BMIs of 40. And this is no shock now why autoimmunity, 4% of the world's population has autoimmune conditions. Of that 4%, Australia has more than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, and and I Go really want to. Yeah, yeah, I really want to just make a point no, just, about Jack. We say I just want I just want people. I don't even want to get into the details of this. I just want people to know. Yeah, that this is tied to this story. Yeah, and it's not a coincidence. It's not genetic. It's not genetic. No, it's not genetic. Okay, that's what the paradigm wants you to believe. Yeah, because if it's genetic, then they can create a drug to keep blocking you from the truth. This is all tied to the frequencies of light that affect that little POMC gene everywhere in you. This is yeah. the reason why your animals are getting the same diseases you're getting. They are subject to the same problems. Yeah. Um, the, the point that I really liked that I want to emphasize that Jack made is that there's, when you have an incongruence in the signals going into the eye and hitting the skin, then you're getting you're getting these problems. And we mentioned briefly earlier in the conversation, but I want to talk about it now, is that wearing sunglasses basically is preventing you, your body, from essentially responding to that light signal on the skin appropriately. So, and, and tell us about, it's, it's alpha well, MSH, well, Matt, I believe. Matt, stop. Let, let's, stop, let's stop for a minute. Let, let's make it blatantly obvious for the non-scientists in the audience. Yeah. What does wearing sunglasses really do? It blocks alpha MSH. Yeah. This is the reason why all Australian women are as white as Casper the ghost. They have atrophic skin. That's why their eyes are blue. That's why they don't tan well. For literally eons, they move from Northern Europe to Europe. this island and they have sheltered themselves. So they're, they're, they look like they don't physically belong on that island, if that's the truth. And they're making it worse every single day. They're blocking yeah. melanin creation through a pathway that they can fix. And the crazy thing is they can easily adapt once they learn how to use the sun properly. Yeah. Um, and I think 
people need to understand that the use of sunglasses actually atrophies your eye. Yeah. It atrophies your skin. Yeah. And yeah. when you understand that the skin is a solar panel for your brain, it should be no shock why humans die from brain diseases and heart diseases. Your heart, uh, the things that innervate your heart is the sympathetic chain and then the vagus nerve, which is part of the brain. Yeah. When these things are broken, humans die from them. Yeah. Blocking the light is the key. I mean, yeah. it, it's so fundamental to understand that there's papers out there uh, uh, about the human heart that if you radiate the human heart after a heart attack with red light, it creates adenosine. Adenosine is the chemical that puts us into sleep, but it also reestablishes the phosphorus cycle that we've been talking about. Yeah. And yeah. the crazy thing is when we do ATLS as doctors, one of the chemicals that we use, you know, to rescue heart rhythms is adenosine. So anybody who's got to be rescued from adenosine in a cardiac standpoint, what does it tell me as a physician? That person never went in the sun. Yeah. Because that's effectively what's happening. They, yeah. You are devoid of red light frequencies and you're paying the toll. You're paying a thermodynamic toll because your heart is failing and you're going to have an MI. Yeah. Peripheral yeah. artery disease, same way. It's a yeah. block of the ferroelectric current in your body. This is yeah. the reason why people that have coronary artery disease and people that have neurodegeneration almost always have peripheral artery disease. And what's the other common tie? If you look in their eye, you'll notice the same thing at Brooks membrane and the RPE, the same PAD peripheral artery disease effect can be seen here. But guess what? The doctors, the young doctors like you aren't being taught why all these things link together. And the reason is because it's light. Yeah. So every time you think you're looking cool like Coco Chanel or Nicole Kidman wearing sunglasses and dyeing your hair and, and putting all kinds of crap on your skin and makeup, Remember, makeup blocks all these light frequencies. Yeah. You are creating havoc in your body. Yeah. That, and that's a, that's a critical part. And I think Jack's really he, he, um, emphasized it. And not only physical disease, not only psychiatric disease, but autoimmune disease, all these are happening when you're messing with a system that evolved to have a congruent message from light signals on the into the eye and on the skin, and when you disrupt that by wearing sunglasses, um, you you you're really setting setting the stage for disease. I want you to talk now about another way that people can disrupt the system, um, and that is say they're on their iPad all night, um, you know, watching uh, cartoons or reading news, and then they're like, "Oh, I'm sli I, I need to sleep. I'll take some melatonin." So why is taking synthetic melatonin? so damaging to this system? Well, if you understand the the system, as we said in the beginning of this podcast, you know, two, two hours and 20 minutes ago, that the system is coupled between light and dark cycles, just like photosynthesis has dark and light cycles in it. Um, any chemical that your body makes, you're not designed to take. That's an axiom that I teach my members. You'll hear me on other podcasts. You hear me when I'm interviewed. I talk about that because when you take something endogenously you make, exogenously, you uncouple the system. So what's the ultimate effect? Right now, I don't know how it is in Australia, but the United States, because of the use of tech screens and, and iPhones, uh, all these kids are blue light toxic. Yeah, They come in and their pupils don't respond because they can't make dopamine in their eye. They're all getting depressed. They're going around doing all kinds of crazy shit. Yeah. And um, the, the main reason that the kids can't sleep is because they're all blue light toxic. Yeah. So when you give a kid melatonin, what are you guaranteeing in their future? You're guaranteeing a world where 40-year-olds will get heart attacks. They'll develop Alzheimer's disease. Their eyes will bleed. They'll have retinal detachments. They'll develop myopia. They will thin their retina. They're, and you can check this, Max. I don't know what type of doctor you are in Fam terms of family, specialty. Family, family this, training. This is yeah. perfect. You should take everybody who's blue light toxic. And I, I don't know if your system will support this, but order an OCT uh, on them. 
an OCT is a is basically a CT scan of your retina. The thing that you'll notice, anybody who's fat will have a thickened choroid. Anybody who's got um, a risk for bleeding, you'll, you'll notice um, lipid changes or drusen, and you'll see thickening in different areas. You'll notice people that are highest risk for neurodegeneration will have problems in their peripheral retina. Like th this is no longer like when I was a resident, I couldn't order tests like this to figure this out. Now that I know how the system works, uh, nothing surprised me. I know exactly what to look for and where to look. Um, if you given your kid melatonin exogenously, you are guaranteeing them huge metabolic problems. You're guaranteeing them that if it's a woman, they're going to have osteoporosis. They'll probably enter perimenopause at 30 years old. Infertility will be off the chain. Uh, I can tell you in the United States right now, it's greater than 60% of young female and males are now infertile for a variety of different reasons. What you'd be shocked to know is beta and gamma MSH control that. What's the hormone that controls fecundity in all mammals? Leptin. Oh, we're back to that story again. Look, this story doesn't go away. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't go away. Yeah. It requires yeah. understanding. It requires you understanding that the physics that controls organisms requires atomic specificity. You giving your kid melatonin is akin to kicking the shit out of your kid in the middle of the airport in Sydney. That's, <laughs> that's the kind of ridiculous yeah. mentality people have. Why? Because, yes, I understand you want your kid to go to sleep. You don't want him to turn into Michael Jackson. But guess what? You're causing the problem by giving him the iPad. Yeah. The exactly. digital babysitter. Yeah. It's a defect in parenting. Why? Because the parents are also low dopamine because yeah. they're watching Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a multi-generational It's uber issue. frustrating. Yeah. So, Jack, I'm going to be, a, uh, for this last segment, I'm going to be a centralized um, doctor and I'm going to give you an explanation for a disease and you can explain to me why this approach is incorrect in under the circadian light light based paradigm. So let's go with skin cancer and melanoma because it's so prevalent here in Australia. And um, we've already talked about this mis mismatch between people of Northern European descent living in an area of very, very high UV index and um, you know, wearing sunglasses, wearing sunscreens and not developing a proper solar callus. And as a result of that, getting sunburnt. But the, the, the centralized medical kind of uh, uh, I will say dogma is that UV light, total cumulative UV light and a light exposure causes um, skin cancer. And they say the best thing you can do is to completely avoid UV light and to block UV light with topical sunscreen. So I know we've already talked about it a little bit, but explain again why this approach is so misguided. It's that guarantees that you're going to get melanoma. If you block UV light, you have to understand that the seminal issue, we have six, six different meta-analysis in the literature. Last one was done in, in Scandinavia, 2016, that show solar exposure leads to long life. If the sun causes uh, cancer to kill you, then there, obviously there's a disconnect somewhere in the understanding of centralized medicine. Not only that, the other disconnect in the dermatology literature, uh, every single skin cancer, melanoma included, is associated with low vitamin D levels. Yeah. Then they have to explain that. That's a huge problem for them. And guess what? They just sidestep it because they don't understand what I explained to you in the first two and a half hours of this podcast. POMC is the key. What melanin does for you, it allows you to absorb and use the UV light properly in your system. Yeah. You putting chemicals or things on you that block that system guarantees you're going to get it. And here's the other irony. When you live a blue light life because technology brings us inside and in front of a screen, guess what actually uh, stimulates uh melanocytes most it's actually blue light yeah and this is a real problem 
As soon as you reintroduce UV light in an incorrect fa fashion, what are you going to stimulate based on what we talked about earlier, Max? You're going to stimulate mitosis. That's the way. This, that's the way the system is screwed up. Yeah. So the key is use sun the way mammals are supposed to use the sun. And remember, we're not talking about the mammals 65 million years ago. The people that live in Australia now are the mammals with the Ferrari engines in their head. Yeah. Their goal uh, with melanoma is not to create an exterior that is atrophic. Because when you do that, you're basically causing the melanocytes in your head to migrate to the surface. When they migrate to the surface and they see UV light, that's when they undergo mitosis. That's effectively yeah. what melanoma is. Yeah. And the key is anything you do to block or make your skin atrophic almost guarantees a melanoma diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they, that, they, that's why it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. You're telling me that I need to get in UV light to avoid melanoma. That's precisely what the literature shows. And, and here's the crazy thing, Max, to prove it even further. I'm going to tell you something I bet you don't know. Uh, I bet you the dermatologists down there don't talk about it. Do you know that melanoma carries a worse prognosis in people that have hypothyroidism? No. You want to know not. why, Max? Go on. Oh, yeah. Well, you need to look it up. Same thing is true about Parkinson's. And I'm going to tell you why. This is a story of POMSI. Um, the reason why is, remember I told you that you make T3 and T4 from the process of phenylalanine going to tyrosine. Tyrosine is what forms T3 and T4. If you block that process, remember, tyrosine ACE is what's inhibited by sunscreens. So if you turn off your ability to make uh, things from phenylalanine and tyrosine, you're effectively turning off the whole mechanism of POMSI. This is the reason why melanoma is much worse in people uh, that have hypothyroidism. And almost everybody that goes to see endocrinologists in Australia, I know because I have a lot of Australian members, they have this problem. Um, there's tremendous amounts of hypothyroidism. And the number one cause in Australia is Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune version, which now you know the reason why, because you're also blocking beta and gamma uh, MSH. That ruins the Th1 and Th2 immuno controls, both cell mediated and humoral immunity. Mm. When you see this right in front of you, you're going, holy shit, this explains everything. And I can tell you that neurologists in our country, and I know neurologists in your country, because you basically do everything we do. Um, they have never been able to figure out why it is that people with Parkinson's are refractory to treatment of Thyroid disease. The same thing is true in melanoma. Why? Because they don't realize this story goes back to POMSI. If you turn off POMSI, you have screwed the pooch. With blue light. And it's it's about turning POMSI back on yeah. and understanding how to do it yeah. and understanding the nuance in the system. It's a light story. And, and you can only imagine how crazy I get when I hear these idiot uh, functional medicine guys telling people, you know, not to eat eggs and do elimination diets, that has absolutely no impact. The reason why the diets play a role, because when you have no POMC made in your gut, your gut microbiome doesn't work either. People forget that the melanin sheets that are in your gut are enterochromaffin cells, and they work with the microbiome that's releasing this light. So if you don't have any enterochromaffin cells, that's the reason why certain foods cause different problems. It's all a story about light. It's not a story about your diet. And if you get out in the sun and fix the exterior problem, you will eventually take all those melanocytes on your skin, suck them back into your gut where they belong, and you won't have a problem. And you'll be very stunned to hear this, Max. Right here, on your skin, in your belly, that overlies your gut, your colon. Do you know that that skin has more palm in it than any other part of the skin on wow. your body? Take a guess why. Because that's what controls the microbiome. Not all the bullshit that you read about in the papers. Interesting. Everything, everything is about light. 
this is the reason why you probably can sense the frustration in my in my response. What, what would you we say? Are making so many. Yeah. What would you say to someone who would say, Jack, to a, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Like, surely not everything could be related to light. Like, what what would you say to that? I I totally get that criticism. You, you know what what I would say? Explain Pomsi to me then. Explain yeah. to me why it's it's absolutely the thing that sticks out in mammalian biology. Yeah, and and it I think has to be. Mm. That's that's the whole key. The key is that criticism is such an easy criticism to lay when you have no fundamental idea uh, yeah. of all the things that we talked about the first two and a half hours. Yeah. yeah. Like to ask me that question, I would say, listen to what Jack and Max talked about the first two and a half hours, because I answered that question already. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is why you're in such a unique position, um, Jack, is because nobody in the medical profession has the intellectual background or even mental models or toolkits to even deeply um, argue or interrogate, um, I guess, the, oh, I disagree the whole story. I think, I, think, I, think, I think you can because all these things, Max, are published in literature. Everything that you mm -hmm. heard in these two and a half hours, none of this is Jack Cruz's opinion. You yeah. know what Jack Cruz is? Jack Cruz is an innovator. He took things because he read a book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, yeah, and saw a story there that was incredible, that a guy could fix his life in a year and actually thought, well, is this physically possible? Yeah. That's all, that's all I did. And I yeah. went back and I looked. This is no different than what Einstein did um, – with the photoelectric effect. I always like to tell this story. I told this story to Rick Rubin when we just did the podcast. I'm going to recount it for you. Because people ask me and say what you just said. If you look at physics in the beginning of the 20th century, you had Helmholtz's uh, studies. We knew about a band gap, a photoelectric effect. We knew about this and that. But nobody could figure out this thing called the ultraviolet catastrophe in physics. Max Planck tried to figure it out, Bohr tried to figure it out, and everybody kind of shit to bed, okay? So when Einstein figured it out in 1905, he wrote one of his papers about the photoelectric effect. How did he solve the problem? They asked Einstein this multiple times in his life, and he goes, well, it was actually pretty simple. He goes, I looked at all the experimental findings, all the things that were published from a thermodynamic standpoint, and I had to make sense of the paradox. And he goes, this was the only plausible answer. So to answer the question that you just asked me about figuring this stuff out, I did exactly the same thing. And it turned out what I needed to do as a biologist, as a clinician, is I needed to zoom in at the past the classical level, past the thermodynamic level, to the quantum level. And I needed to figure out what the hell Pomsi was really doing. And once, once I realized that, I mean, this all made total sense. I mean, this is not, I don't think this is difficult. I really don't think this is difficult to understand as I've laid it out for you here. I think the hard part for you to understand is how I figured it out. When mm -hmm. you hear that story, like I just laid out for you, then I would agree with you <laughs> that, yeah, maybe it's going to take somebody that has a, a full understanding of biology, chemistry, and physics to do that. That may be one of my unique things, but I would tell you where that uniqueness came from was being a poor white kid growing up in the richest city in the world always going to museums and always being intensely curious. curious I am the most curiosity. curious person you're ever meet. Yeah. I am curious. totally more curious than anybody you'll ever meet. Why? Because when I hear of a paradox, I want to solve it. It's to me, yeah. it's like a puzzle. I, I feel like my whole medical career has been a puzzle, like figuring out why people 
are now getting gliomas who have low vitamin Ds. I know yeah. the answer now. I can yeah. tell you when I started neurosurgery, I didn't. Or yeah. I'll give you another one, Max, just because I'm trying to tickle, I'm trying to tickle your fancy, but actually tickle your neocortex. I know as a family practice doctor, uh, you learn probably very briefly about um, uh, a disease called neurofibromatosis, okay? You know that the diagnostic criteria, you may not remember this, but you'll remember when I say it, is if you have six cafe au lait spots on your skin, you know what you'll find, Max, when you look? Those cafe au lait spots are always in the same dermatome on the skin that you'll find them inside. How do you like that? Isn't that part of the melanin story, my friend? Because it's ectodermal in origin. Is that? You got it. See, like, like you went to the same damn training I did. I guarantee you never heard either from a neurosurgeon, a neurologist, or a dermatologist. Yeah, why is cafe au lait spots associated with this condition? Well, guess what, Max? I think after this two and a half hours, you know exactly why. Because the melanin that used to be in those nerves is now on the skin. Mm, mm. Yeah. Got the, it? The, the question I was also going to ask you is, as someone who is so intensely curious and a full-time working neurosurgeon, how did you have time to explore this this passion project and these intellectual questions in addition to time. to having, this having is, a family? This is the reason and, I became a doctor. Yeah. Dude, yeah. This, is, this, is, this, is, this is absolutely... As a little boy who went to the Museum of Natural History and saw the mummies and saw the T-Rex bones and saw us going to the butcher shop and seeing a heart and seeing the brains of a cow and thinking to myself, I want to know how this shit works. Yeah. I'm To this day, I'm still fascinated by my job. I'm fascinated by my job differently than I used to be 20, 30 years ago. Why? Because now that I see people falling apart in hospitals, now I can explain why they're falling apart. And the, the real, I guess, conundrum for my problem is I know that this answer works and it works for everybody. The problem is it requires humans to realize that they're creating their own asteroid by the light they use. With the artificial light environment. Therein lies the problem. Yeah. yeah. Correct. It goes yeah. all the way back to what Darwin said in his book, of the two conditions of existence and natural selection. You have to realize, Max, that our profession has built a paradigm of belief that the genome and GWA studies are the key. They're yeah. not the key. And you know what should have woken all of us up? And, and I'm putting this on you. I'm, I'm putting this on your lap because I believe you're also part of the problem. You have to ask the simple questions. The, the things that I'm trying to resonate with you in this podcast, don't you think as a young doctor, you should have asked when you found out that we had the same number of genes? That doesn't make any sense through a neo-Darwinistic per perspective. If Watson and Crick are right, how is this possible? Yeah, This doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, and Jack, and that's and, that, that's a that's a discussion about mitochondrial heteroplasmy and 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 Dr. Wallace right. and and that's an, that's a, I think we should do another podcast on that because that that is so essential to talk about um, and mitochondrial DNA. Um, but well, the, I think you need to assimilate this lesson first. This lesson okay. to me has such far-reaching uh, uh, implications that I think if you add the other parts. Too quick. You need to understand Pomsi is the story of light. I always tell people there's a three-legged stool, light, water, and magnetism. You cannot master the other two until you get this one. Yeah. Okay. This one is by far the most interesting and the most complicated one because light is the most complicated thing to understand. But when you realize that you need to understand light, as a centralized physician or a patient through the eyes of one gene that cleaves to these other things, boy, I'll tell you what, light becomes a lot more simple to understand. Yeah. And and is there anything in the light story that we haven't talked about that you think is really essential that we should fill in for the listener? Oh, yeah. There's plenty of other things. But, I mean, most of those would require 
you understanding a little bit of physics. I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, like I always tell people this: the last, the last blog that I ever wrote, um, which was probably 15, 16 years ago. Uh, one of my good friends who has a fatal disease, cystic fibrosis, he was told he was going to die when he was six years old. He's now 40 years old and he looks just like Michelangelo Zadonis. He follows everything I tell him to do. Yeah. In fact, I'm getting ready to go on a cruise ship with him in the sun uh, in a couple of days. Um, he told me, he said, you know what you need to do? He goes, you need to release for your members the edge of your science. Like, where have you stopped? Yes, yes. In your understanding. So I did. I did a I did a webinar in April of 2016. So you can see we're in 2023. So this is now seven years ago. And it's a three and a half hour webinar about how we cleave a proton utilizing a neutrino that we capture via melanin. Okay. How's that? That's that's that is just yeah. Think about I mean, what, that that's tears of. Think about of, where we just talked. Yeah. Just think about where we just talked. Well, I didn't mention to you too much about protons. I didn't mention to you too much about neutrinos, but I certainly talked to you about melanin, did I? Well, how many people could have that conversation with you in the world? Like what? Uh, oh, ten, hundred, few, ten, ten. You know what the problem is? Like how many? You people? have to you have to make the link. You have to make the link for them. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. You have to do things like I've been doing for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, I've done thousands of podcasts, thousands. And I'm always amazed that people don't ask the right questions. They always ask the stupid shit about macros, about biochemistry, about this and that. I'm like, that's not the story. Well, I hope the I haven't asked too is, many stupid questions. No, you actually, you actually did good. But before we started this, you said, Jack... Let's talk about light. I think where you thought we were going to go where light was not where I brought you. No, no, but I'm glad because I haven't heard this part of the story before. Well, it's because I never told it to anybody. The first person I ever told it to was Rick Rubin and Andrew Uberman in the beginning of March this year. Yeah. Because they asked me to come out and do it because Rick believes that the reason that my science hasn't resonated with the world yet is because the centralized paradigm is so buried in big pharma profit that yeah. they will they will continue to try to send the FBI and people to ban my TED Talks, just like they've done when I first started this. But COVID's changed everything. Uh, people now in the United States do not trust their government. They do not trust centralized paradigms. They do not trust the ivory tower. Yeah, And Rick fundamentally believes, even though he's the greatest music producer in the world, he happens to be my friend. I happen to help save his life. He said, Jack, I want you to come on my podcast and tell people what you did for me and lay the science out. Like, tell them like it's never been told before. He said, spill your guts. And um, the only I, I was resistant to do it because I knew that it was opening up a door that probably would get me in trouble again. And um, when he agreed to talk about his own medical problem and how I helped him uh, and how centralized physicians like yourself, I don't know in Australia if you know this guy, but Peter Adia is uh, got a famous podcast in the States called yeah. The Drive. Yeah, yeah. He's a guy that is making mistakes left and right in the paradigm but he's a, a really good friend of Rick's. And uh, when I gave Rick the advice that I gave him to overcome his aortic stenosis and his uh, aortic aneurysm, not even the surgeons that operated on Rick at Stanford University could believe what I told him. And when PETA went back and looked at the papers after the surgery was over, he's like, you know, this, this advice that you got was actually brilliant. What because advice I didn't did you realize. give? What 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 advice? Would, well, that's not that's okay. not that's not material. Okay. It's really not. The point okay. I'm trying to make is is I'm trying to hammer this point home that you have to, as a physician, to solve your patients' problems, really truly understand how they fell apart to begin with. And yeah. if you don't understand 
that it's a light-based story, it's not the story you've been told, then you are failing as a clinician. Like, yeah. I know, Max, that you didn't learn any of this, but you have to remember something. Neither did I. Yeah, yeah. But I asked the question, why was I a fat ass? Why did I gain 150 pounds after my residency? Well, it's blatantly obvious now. My residency kept me in blue light yeah, you... for seven, eight, ten years of my life. Yeah. And I was up every night. Yeah. I never would have thought in a million years that the choices that I was making around my profession to be a neurosurgeon were actually what got me in trouble. And I told you when I figured out the leptin prescription and the cold thermogenesis protocol, I didn't even believe it was going to work when I did it on me. Yeah. I yeah. fundamentally didn't believe it. That is the essence of science. Mm. That's what a hypothesis is. Yeah. And if you think about like, your country, especially, you guys just went through this with COVID. Your government is still lying to you. They told us all to social distance and stay in our house. The absolute wrong thing to do with any virus, especially yeah. for the immune system. Yeah. Wear a mask. That's even stupider. Yeah. Because yeah. it decreases your oxygen and but it's going to affect the way your immune system can operate. But this is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. That you have to question authority. If you don't question authority, you're not doing science. You're doing pseudoscience. Yeah. Before, and, sorry, Jack. To, I was just going to say, before I started my family medicine training, I was in the emergency department. Um, and I was the only I was the only one there wearing a pair of UVX, UVX blue blocking glasses. And uh, patients would kind of ask me, nurses and other doctors would ask me, they thought I was making a fashion statement, but uh, I, I gave them my glasses and I explained the, the blue light story very briefly. Um, and I made the observation and we're talking about science, we're talking about the scientific process, hypothesis generation. The, some of the most unhealthy people that I, colleagues that I've seen in, in, in medicine have been um, in the emergency department um, uh, and I really think that so much of the story is blue light toxicity for them. Um, premature graying, balding, um, just overweight, you know, hair thinning in, in, in women. It's, it's actually quite profound um, that I, I it observed. Is. It's well, the well, biggest problem in the world. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And I, I will tell you, here's the other thing that they can't handle. I, I used to be very, very bombastic about stuff like this. I said, look, you're a bunch of low dopamine idiots. You don't realize the major neurotransmitter in the frontal lobes where all executive function and thinking, cognitive ability is, is dopamine and neuroadrenaline. That's what's here. Yeah. And neither one of you seem to realize that this is all controlled by do dopa and melanin. And that's it. That's all you need to know. And the crazy thing is cold in the literature has been shown to increase dopamine and neuroadrenaline. You can make it two ways. There's two different ways to do it. And the reason why there's two different ways is because that's how mammals did it way back in the beginning. This story, without understanding our family, our origins, I don't believe this will ever penetrate the skulls of centralized medicine. And you know what? I'm past the point of trying to educate those people, um, Max, because I think it's more important to go take this message directly to patients. Yeah, Patients yeah. control their light environment more than the doctor can. And I think when people get brave enough to trust their own doctor in their head with their intuition, if you listen to what you and I have talked about today, none of this. I mean, it's amazing to me. No wild animals wear sunscreen or sunglasses. The only animals that get diseases that we have are the ones that are in the zoos. Yeah. And, and hopefully somebody will be listening to this in Australia and realize, is Jack fundamentally saying that we're zoo mammals? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Precisely. We don't we're, live like yeah. we're supposed to live. Yeah, we're living in an evolutionarily inconsistent environment. That's the key point here. And right. that's that's what I've said, you know, in previous podcasts. And it's a it's um it's a dietary inconsistency, but fundamentally, as what we've talked about for the past two hours forty, is that it's a light um, imbalance, and we're living in an evolutionarily oh, people need to know inconsistent that diet. Is light? Yeah. Diet is light. I yeah. mean, look, it's it's the most incompatible thing for people to talk about food and not realize that the basis of food is photosynthesis. 
okay, tell me what you know about chlorophyll. Tell me what you know about magnesium. I just told you earlier about it. And then I said, okay, tell me about your family. Most people don't even realize that mammals can make sugar from blue light through ACTH. And then when you talk about CLIP, all of a sudden you can see like the low carb, high fat guys, their, their heads explode. And how many times do I post pictures that show papers that show you don't need to eat any food to drive blood glucose up? Yeah. Just put a cell phone to the side of your head. Look yeah. at a computer screen. Yeah. And, and now you know the reason why. Yeah, but it's not a pathologic problem, Max. No. It's not pathologic. We're built that way by nature. That's what Palm C does. Yeah. Yeah, look, and I, I've used I use low carb. Um and I think that I I showed you my my um flyer, my circadian health flyer. So I I I use low carb as a first entry point into into lifestyle change and particularly just removing processed foods. But um, I also talk about light, and I also talk about the circadian rhythm. I so, want you to change. I want you. To, I want you to change your paradigm right now. Tell people that low carb is about going on a technology diet, not so much a food diet, because of POMC. If you tell people that, then this podcast will have been worth it. Why? Because the food exacerbates the POMC problem. The food exacerbates the ACTH, the clip. That's the story. Yeah. Tell everybody you know that you come from a family of animals that makes food from light. That is the key. Once you understand that, then I'm okay with you going after people about eating cheesecake and, um, and, you know, cannolis and whatever the hell else you guys eat in in Australia. Well, here, the here, bottom line is they eat deep fried. The bottom meat. line for me is mm. I don't want people to lead with food. I want people to lead with light because that is the story of our species. Yeah. And and it is you, fundamental. It's fundamental. Uh, uh, and and uh, do you conceptualize the harm of the food from uh like for its degree to provoke insulin resistance or are you thinking about deuterium or w tell me exactly how you I think about everything. Yeah. I, I yeah. think about everything. I mean, the, the biophysics of the modern food system is a complete train wreck. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is that you, this is where I have a personal problem. I see people like Peter Addy or Terry walls or, you know, all the people that were tied to the paleo community. Some of the idiots that you guys had, what's his name? Pete Evans down in Australia. Um, they, it's always food first and food is the wrong fucking answer. It's light. And until people understand that it's light, we're never going to solve this problem. This is the reason why you hear me on every podcast say that a half truth always leads to a full lie. Full lie we yeah. always bury yeah. this story and we cannot do that. If we, if we really are centralized doctors who want to make a point to our patients, we need to start with this story, Max. This is this is the story of your biologic life. As a physician, as a patient, uh, you can do more for your patients by having them sit down and listen to this three-hour lecture on mammals, POMSI, melanin, and all the little pieces of the story. Talking about the nuances, which you just wanted to jump in with deuterium and all that. Look, you'll lose people at hello yeah, yeah. if you do that. That's the reason why I never started with this stuff. Yeah. Because you have to give people a framework of how this works. And in my opinion, what happened at the KT event sticks out like a sore th thumb in evolutionary history. Like these animals that took over the world from these huge dinosaurs. I mean, it's just, it's the story of a lifetime. And not only that, it's actually the reason why Hollywood keeps making dinosaur movies. Because I think humans at a fundamental core are fascinated that we took over the world from a T-Rex. I think yeah. they're stunned at that. And for some reason, I think this elevates their ego. And the problem is... They need to really understand why it happened. 
And then they need to understand that the same thing, the killing machine that was the T-Rex got taken out. He was a perfect animal on this planet. He got taken out from something outside the system. We are getting taken out by the designs of our two frontal lobes. Yes. That yeah. is the ultimate irony. Yeah, it's an unforced error. It's a, it's an own goal, isn't it? It's a yes. own creation. And to me, that is the story that Uncle Jack loves to talk about. Yeah. That when humans begin to realize that they have been looking at their own asteroid for the last 125 years, and this is the reason why the most beautiful quantum computer in their body, their brain and their heart, is now falling apart. Yeah. Um, and leading to all these other problems. And understand that the way in which nature put us together, we are a collection of biophysical properties that control everything about us. And the better you live, you know, I, I try to make this case with the semiconductor fabrication plate. It's like Intel knows that they have to move atoms in a certain place to get the effect of the motherboard that works your iPhone. Yeah. When are we going to get the idea that we need to do the same thing in biology, except turns out we're a little bit more subject to those laws than silicon. Yeah. And you can look at a periodic table and see where silicon is and see where carbon is. And you'll notice there's a reason that we're not silicon based. You need yeah. to be carbon based because carbon is wide band gapped. Yeah. That means that atomic precision is more important. You asked me the question about the SCN. This is now 80,000 foot view. The SCN is import important because it creates the atomic precision. That's the truth. And vitamin D is important on the outside because it protects the, the nuclear spin of electrons and proteins on the inside of your mitochondria. Now, to say that to an audience like this, you have to have an understanding of all the other processes yeah. that we already talked about. Yeah. Because if you lead with that, people are going to continue to think that exercise and diet are the key. And exercise and diet can't explain the Sherpas in the Himalayan mountains. But guess what? The story of the Sherpas in the Himalayan mountains I got from Robin Sharma's book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And when I looked into what they were able to do, I realized that there are so many fallacies around. People think that they need to have big, huge muscles now to impact glucose and insulin. That is total false. And Sherpas are the ideal mammal on this planet that prove it. The Aborigines used to be. The Eskimos used to be. But the Sherpas are the one last remaining wild human people on the planet. That these people that weigh 125 pounds can carry 300 pounds of gear for Northern European people to climb Everest. Yeah, for eating and lentils. All tan. Eating lentils and rice. Well, no, they actually, they actually eat butter. Okay. Grass-fed butter. Going up the mountain. I'm talking about as they're fueling themselves. Okay. Nothing but saturated fat while they're climbing at 20, 30,000 feet with, even though they're at high latitude, you know, 27, 28 latitude, they're getting more UV light as they go up in altitude. That's why they're all tan. Yeah. Yeah. We need this story. These people are palm sea creating machines. And no, they don't look like an NFL middle linebacker or a rugby player in Australia. Because humans are the mammals that buried their mitochondrial capacity here and here, not in our muscles. The muscles, that's what the gorillas did. Yeah. And if you bury the mitochondrial density in your muscles, like the centralized doctors who are involved in that, like the PETA Addies of the world, we are going to create people that have decreased longevity. Nobody who has hypertrophied muscles is going to live a long life. That is the most counterintuitive statement that I'll make because most of the people that are listening to this are going to be like, how can you say that? I've already told you the reason why. That's the story of Pomsi. Yeah. And Jack, the did, proof in the pudding is the Sherpas. Yeah. There's two situations, clinical situations, that I want to get your opinion on before we wrap this up. The first one is an observation that I made is that people – my age, particularly young men, are increasingly 
balding with refractory errors. So there's almost, it's become so common that there's actually an internet meme the where there's like an illustration of a young guy, he's bald and he's he's got glasses on. Um, and it seems to me that blue light toxicity is a key function or key player in in this combination of both balding head, gray, graying, premature graying, perhaps even before that, and um, mm -hmm. um, refractory error. What, what, what's your take on that that kind of observation or, or phenomenon in young men that we're seeing? Yeah, it's obvious. I mean, blatantly obvious. I already told you the answer, but I'll, I'll explain it to you again. When you have ACTH and CLIP, CLE from POMC, it drives huge amounts of glucose and insulin in the child from the time it's born all the way up until puberty and past puberty. What does that do? It creates a precocious puberty in the hypothalamus where you'll create much more of the sex steroid hormones. That's predominantly in men going to be testosterone. Anytime you have high levels of testosterone, you tend to lose your hair. The other problem that comes with blue light, it ruins the circadian mechanism. So the hair follicle in humans is also controlled by the optics. So your hair will fall out, the hair will gray faster. And um, the reason why the testosterone issue is big, when you release testosterone from um, your hypothalamus, it's through a process called FSH and LH through GNRH. Three um, chemicals control this, kisipeptin, dynorphin, and um, blanking on the other one. But anyway, they're all controlled by POMC. POMC is humongous in this part of the hypothalamus. Yeah. Guess what turns off testosterone normally in men on your surface? UV light. So now you know the answer. You're stimulating blue light through the, the early part of your life. You're basically creating an andropause. Hmm. And the off switch, to all the testosterone creation is UV light, which in Australia, you guys put sunglasses on, sunscreen, clothes, and you never go outside. Yeah. That's the answer. Yeah. And, and that's that, why you go bald. Yeah. Testosterone level goes up. And then functionally, you get andropause when you're 40 years old. Yeah. You know, your 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 sex life goes to shit. You're taking Viagra. Um, you wind up getting divorced three or four times because yeah. you don't realize your low dopamine state. You're a bad mate. You're a bad husband. You're a bad father. Um, this has such far reaching uh, issues. I almost don't want to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you because I've wrote about it and I talked to Rick about it. It also explains the reason why we're seeing all the transgender stuff in the world. Because um, through the process of screens, we are now engineering people's hypothalamuses in, in different ways. And people have, have really commented. See, I'm older, so I've seen this transition in young kids and why this has happened. It doesn't mean necessarily that I'm putting a negative connotation on that lifestyle. But I, I could care less about that. You can do whatever you want. My interest is on the biologic side. I want to know why it's happening. Why is this more common today than it was when I was 10 or 15 years old? Like I come to this like, I can't believe kids today in Asia don't want to have sex. Um, when I was 15, that's all I wanted to do. The reason for that is because of this blue light problem. But what about uh, environmental endocrine disruptors? How about that? Oh, well, yeah, Since that's an issue. But, but Max, that's what the functional and allopathic and yeah. naturopathic guys want to do. Because guess what they're doing? They're making up a bullshit story so that they can make money by ordering labs on people. They're doing the same thing, the same mistakes that you and I make in centralized medicine, where we'll do labs on people to write prescriptions. We get vilified by those people for doing that. Yeah. They do the same thing with supplements and all the other bullshit that they want to talk about. The bottom yeah. line is endoc endocrine disruptors are an issue. I'm not trying to say they're not, but they're like fourth or fifth on the list. First on the list, without a doubt, is light. I mean, and I would tell you, light is probably second, third, and fourth <laughs> before you get to that. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, the the I really liked your explanation. Thanks for explaining that that phenomenon that I'm seeing. Um, you know, guys going bald. You know, their their dad they've got less hair than their fathers. Um, you know, and their fathers. So Max, are I want to stop 60. you for a minute. I want to I want to stop you for a minute. Go on. So you said thanks to me for this. Remember what you said to me about 30, 40 minutes ago? 
Jack, your credit will say everything looks like a nail uh, because of this. What did I just tell you the answer was? It always ties back to light. It ties back to POMC. So your centralized doctor didn't understand why this is happening. But Uncle Jack was able to figure it out pretty easy. You understand yeah. what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Maybe, just maybe, this POMC thing explains a lot more than you want to know. Mm. I, I'm at the beginning you just of the need rabbit to hole. Understand how it works. Yeah, and I'm I'm very it's open to rabbit hole. Yeah, and and it's the, the it's the rabbit hole that's defined my life. Okay, and, that's that's the truth. Yeah, and, and and the other, I guess, explanation I want you to, if if you could offer, um, which is, and I think this will be a slam dunk for for Uncle Jack, will be why do we constantly observe such a low vitamin D serum vitamin D in people who are overweight and obese? Um, the main reason is, is, um, the signal transduction pathway. I actually have a Twitter feed about this max that you can read. I, I lay it out. Basically when you go in the sun, if you're not able to build the optics, like I, I've tried, I'm going to try to make this even easier. I want to take the physics out of it. It's equivalent to taking a nuclear power plant and funneling in electricity into a 1920s house in Melbourne. You're going to blow the circuits. So the big issue is to make cholesterol, I should say to make vitamin D, cholesterol has to be sulfated. You have to be in the sun to do that. When cholesterol is not sulfated, you can convert vitamin D. The other big issue is the vitamin D, it has to be created in the skin it gets converted to 125, the active hormone in your liver and kidney. Well, when your liver and kidney are also missing the melanin, that conversion never happens. So you could functionally, like when you're atrophic Australian who blue eyed, white hair uh, and light skin, no palm see anywhere on the exterior, you effectively are the opposite of Arnold Schwarzenegger. You have taken everything that you need to make vitamin D out of your skin. Therefore, I could put you naked on the equator at Darwin or in Queensland. And all you're going to do is get really bad sunburns and blister. And you're yeah. going to think that the sun's bad for you because you don't realize that you've created the most atrophic organ in your body. And here's the crazy thing. The sun is the, I should say the skin is the biggest organ in the body. This is a huge problem. Yeah. Um, and the reason why we, I, I don't know what you guys are seeing down in Australia, but I can tell you, we are seeing an epidemic of people that live at a pretty good latitude that even when you put them outside, they can't do the things you do. So that's part of the reason why I wrote a, a Patreon blog. I don't know. It's probably like five, six years now called the solar callus. Like yeah. how do you, uh, hypertrophy your skin properly so that you don't have the experience that like Northern Europeans in Australia have. Well, you see that light on behind me. It's now, you know, we've been going over three hours. So the sun is up. I'm still inside. Those lights will be turned off. Yeah. Um, you want to be out in the sun. This is the time of the day to get that. You need to get that red light on your skin the red light preconditions your skin for UV. When I say that, I actually mean it. It means that you're sulfating the cholesterol, the heparin, the uh, amino glycans um, in your extracellular space so that those all those things are doped with both phosphorus and sulfur so that you can convert uh, the cholesterol ester, the 7-deoxy cholesterol, with 312 nanomino light, knock out the double bond, and then you have 25 dihydroxy vitamin D, and it can go to your liver and go to your kidney and be converted. Um, the steps where it can be broken, it can be broken at the skin level or at the level of the liver yeah, or the level of the kidney. And, and uh, most people today, it's broken at multiple levels. Yeah. And the key thing I would say in Australia, though, I think the skin is a huge problem. You guys, you guys are a walking factory of men and women that are pale as pale can be. And it just astounds me that people 
have not looked into this link. I, I, I mean, truly, I would have assumed that somebody would have tripped over it way before me, but apparently not. I don't mm. know. Yeah. Well, um, well, Jack, uh, thank you so much. I, I mean, I, that's we've just we've just gone over three hours. I think we've done a incredibly in depth discussion, and we've covered a very, very, very wide range of topics surrounding light. Um, and at the end, we've talked about the, some clinical um, applications of it. Um, uh, do you have any final closing thoughts or any anything that you want to part with or messages to the audience? Yeah. I mean, I want you to know that your family dictates everything about you. Um, you need to learn about POMC. You need to learn about light. You need to know how those cleavage occur in different places, like different zip codes will lead to different outcomes in that POMC gene. That's true. Even in, in the organs in your body. Yeah. Don't assume just going to a low latitude is all that matters. When you, when you understand this POMC story, you'll go back and listen to my old podcast. You'll go back and look at my old blogs. You'll go, this guy has been telling us this the whole time, but you know what? Our frame reference for understanding what he was saying wasn't detailed enough. Mm. Well, now it is. Yeah. And basically what I'm telling everybody is when you become armed with this information, you're going to realize that everything in the centralized world is a freaking lie. And it's going to strip some of you down to the core. That 18 months when I realized it, that was the hardest 18 months of my life to realize that I wasted 40 years of my life studying all the things that Max knows. I Look, I know all the biochemistry, ice cold. I was the top of my class. And it turns out that I realized how stupid I was, that I believed those centralized authorities, that this was the most important thing. And in fact, what I did is I created a huge profit center for big pharma. That's what I did. And the Hippocratic Oath that I took in medical school, I failed my patients. I did a lot of harm. But I did a lot of harm for ignorance. And there's a saying, at least in the States, I don't know if it's present in Oz, that ignorance is not a defense. So I'm telling you. That's big of you to say, Jeff. I don't Jack. defend it. The reason I, it's big of you to, you know, to I go, say I that. Go and, out. Yeah. Well, it's true. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, look, the truth shouldn't be hard to tell people. It's yeah. the truth. And my goal is to get young doctors to understand that they're being lied to for the same reasons. And it's incumbent upon them to take some of the things that I've said in this podcast, really examine them. I want you to all prove me wrong. I've been waiting for it. I'm ready for all of you. But I think what you're going to find is when you start to do some of this for your patients, magically, they're going to start getting better and they're going to love you for it. And you're going to realize for the first time in your life what being a doctor is really all about. That's why... Decentralized medicine, in my opinion, needs to completely replace the centralized paradigm. Yeah. And the best way for you to start is learning about POMC. Yeah. And and to, to round it all up, let's just give patient, patients and, and listeners just the, the real basic framework for starting in terms of, I mean, you've, you've said so many good things about getting early morning sunlight, um, maybe three key things that um, that a listener who's come this three hour journey with us can really take to the bank and implement in their life. It's very simple. I'll, I'll give you the, the story that I used to tell people in the early podcast 15 years ago, mimic the Sphinx every morning, look to the East as the sun rises, never miss another sunrise the rest of your life and put all your extremities on the earth, feet and hands stay there for as long as you can because that's the key. The second thing is eat like a great white shark. You want to eat mostly protein and fat. You can eat your carbohydrates, but do it in the morning. And probably the third and most important thing, uh, come up with a sleep hygiene program where you absolutely limit all artifice or light after the sun sets. Those are the three things you do. You, that's where you should start. Then if you want you know, more details, then you're probably going to have to sign up for my Patreon blog or listen to my Q and A's that I do for my members. Cause that's where I go into the, the nitty gritty details. That's where yeah. I split your head open yeah. about quantum mechanics. 
Yeah, well, um, Uncle Jack, Dr. Cruz, thank you so much um, for a very enlightening and incredibly in-depth um, discussion. So uh, I guess we'll have to do some more when we talk about water and magnetism, but uh, this is uh, more than enough for, for one, one, one episode. So thank you again. All right, no problem. Okay, guys, what did you think of that podcast? How incredible was Dr. Cruz? Well, it was about 1.30 a.m. in the morning uh, by the time we wrapped up that three-hour monster of an interview. And it was it was something that I've been really kind of thinking about since. And I guess Dr. Cruz's approach is, is so different to uh, a dietary-centered paradigm where we're thinking about things like the carbohydrate insulin model of obesity. We're thinking about the effect of seed oils and polyunsaturated uh, omega-6 oils on, on insulin resistance and mitochondrial function. Um, and it's it's radically different to all the other models of health that, um, that are basically ignoring, I guess, or not factoring in uh, light and, and its effect on, on the body. I think the most fascinating thing for me is how the Jack, Dr. Jack's, Jack's point, which is that the biochemistry has to rely on the biophysics. So you have we have to have an understanding of the biophysics um, first before we can make coherent sense of the biochemistry. And this idea that food is a photosynthetic barcode, so it is simply a product of photosynthesis, um, and therefore that's that's how it kind of fits into into the model that that he's describing. Um, I have never, well, prior to you know interviewing Dr. Cruz and um, you know kind of exploring this pathway, things like leptin and the leptin specifically the leptin melanocort Corton pathway was nothing that I had really delved deeply into. Um, neither, again, we'd I'd heard about POMC in in medical school and throughout university, but never in the context that um, it was described here. So, yeah, lots of food for thought, lots of fascinating implications, and this idea that the light environment um, is so critical to optimal health and to metabolic health is an idea that that I'm going to. Uh, further explore and, and and keep kind of uh, rolling with so there's there's a, a fascinating bunch of um guys and 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 girls in this circadian health space that are specifically talking about um light and mitochondria um and the related topics so in the next months and um yeah i'll be getting a lot of them on the podcast to really build out this this understanding and help explore the the topic of light and, and disease so i hope you all enjoyed this and if you did please comment on the video please like it subscribe and follow on all the the podcasting platforms and sign up to dr cruz's patreon page because what he described in this interview he elaborates in depth uh in his patreon subscriber uh, regular letters, um, blog posts. So have a look there. And he, Dr. Cruz has done so many interviews on YouTube and I've, I've listened to a, to a fair few, but, but by any means, not all of them. So he explains all kinds of, and elaborates these points in his, his other interviews. So yeah, thanks very much. And, um, yeah, looking forward to, uh, interviewing Dr. Cruz again on the topics of water and, and magnetism, which are, as he talks about, the three legs of, of the stool in terms of his model of, of health and disease. Um, and I think it's not incongruent with, with the approach that um, I'm currently taking, which is emphasizing very low carbohydrate diet, which is consistent with that idea of uh, seasonal eating based on the photosynthetic availability um, in the area and high carb, uh, sorry, low carb, high high protein, high fat diet um, is something that Dr. Cruz mentioned in at the end of the podcast uh, as being one of his recommendations. So um, I think incorporating the circadian practice in the context of uh, processed food, free diet that's rich in animal food and fat um, is going to continue to be my message um 
so yeah any comments yeah please comment below and yeah share this this one widely thank you very much